Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Did I get a good morning back? Yeah, it's early enough. Thank you. Um, I'm Jim Gray. I'm the mayor of Lexington, for those of you from beyond our boundaries. And I want to start by just commenting a little bit about this event, but first by saying I bet that many of you are like me when someone may come up to you and ask you to describe your job. And you look at them, you shrug your shoulders, and you sort of say, well, it's just a routine, not a big deal. But you know, it is a big deal. You know that it is a big deal, and they know it's a big deal. Well, such is the case with university cities. I think it was in 2013, I was talking to Scott Shapiro, and he described, he was doing a benchmarking project, and he described that he was coming up with some data that made it, that looked like we were different. Lexington was a little different. That's when I said, well, you know, the last thing a fish can describe is water. We often don't know how to describe ourselves. We don't know sometimes exactly what it's like. To put that in objective terms, we know it subjectively, but we don't always know it objectively. So Scott's data was telling us that Lexington was different and that there were some other, there's some other cities around the country that are similar. More than college towns, but some not quite the big metropolis, big cities where colleges and universities were less of the fabric of the city or represented less of the fabric of the city. That yes, Lexington was like some other cities in the country and we began identifying those cities. Ann Arbor and Madison, not unexpectedly. Lincoln and Fort Collins and Raleigh-Durham and then Lexington. I think that's six, wasn't it, Scott? I got them down now. And the more he dug into it, the more he dug into the DNA of these cities, the more we discovered that there was something here to look at carefully. So, here we are today. A few years later, this will be the inaugural event, the inaugural, inaugural University Cities Conference or Summit. So we welcome everyone. Let me pay a special welcome to a few folks who are partners in this project with us. And that, <coughs> that includes the University of Kentucky. Let's give a big hand to the University of Kentucky, President Eli Capilouto. <laughs> President Eli Capilouto, who's gonna join us later. Many of his staff are here. I know Melody Flowers has been very involved in the project. Ken Trosky and Phil Harling from the Gaines Center for the Humanities, all who have helped make this happen. I also wanna welcome several council members who are here. I see our vice mayor, along with Jay Gibbs, council member from our district right here at the university, our downtown. And I also wanna welcome a special welcome to two of my colleagues, mayors from Fort Collins and Lincoln, and that's Wade Troxell and Chris Beichler. Chris, hold your hand up. You're going to hear more from them later. And I believe I haven't met Howard yet. Is Howard Lazarus here? Howard, did he not make... Howard was scheduled to be with us from Ann Arbor. He's, he'll be here. He'll be here later. Okay, that's great. So thank you all for welcoming them. Now I want to uh, introduce Scott, who is going to share more about the project. I've already described what he did in the last, what he did uh, early on in this discovery process. Scott is our Chief Innovation Officer for the Mayor's Office, 
and he has worked on this project relentlessly. So Scott, come on up here and tell us more about where we're gonna go today, our guests, and all that we're gonna learn. Thank you, Mayor. Great, well thank you guys so much for, for coming. This is, a, I think, a big day for, for us in the, in the mayor's office. We have been working on this for, um, for some time. It's, uh, it's been a, um, consuming as of, as of late, as we're getting ready for the, the conference. But we're really excited to, to, to talk to you about what we've discovered. Um, the way we describe it is that we've discovered a new species of city, sort of a, a, a species of city that folks haven't um, described before. We can all think about different kinds of cities, um, tourist destinations or um, uh, border towns um, or uh, metropolises um, or port cities, post-industrial cities. So all these cities um, probably share some similar traits with, with one another. Um, but for Lexington, we weren't, um, we wanted to find out more about, about our city. So we did start with a benchmarking project that the mayor uh, assigned me. I was looking at some data uh, for Lexington. And what I wanted to do was take a look at a wide range of data. Um, anything I could, I could find that was, that was public. So we were looking at uh, violent crime rates. We were looking at uh, unemployment rates. We were looking at business starts, arts and culture. Um, really education, anything we could find to see sort of what's going on here in Lexington. Um, and it turned out that Lexington was really doing very well, which is nice to see, right, on all these, on all these measures. Um, and what it started to look like was a, a confirmation of what we all know, the folks who are here from Lexington, what we all know is that Lexington is a very, is a very cool place. Um, how many people think Lexington is a cool place living here, right? <laughs> So this confirms, uh, this data sort of confirms that, but it said something else to us. It said that there are other cities that uh, were very similar to Lexington, that were similarly off the charts on all these data sets. Um, and it turns out that all these cities uh, shared this same um, set of, of criteria. So they all were former college towns that as we say, the college towns that grew up. So they were between 250,000 and a million in terms of their, their metropolitan area. Um, they all had uh, R1 research universities in the center of the city. Um, it turns out that the city, cities of similar size that have the university that are just on the outskirts um, of the city, you don't get this sort of constellation of effects that I'll be, that I'll, of uh, positive effects that I'll be, be talking about. And the third is that there's a, percent of the population um, that are students, that's 10% or above. So if you, if you look at that three criteria, it is, as the mayor said, these six cities, Ann Arbor, Durham, Chapel Hill, Fort Collins, Lexington, Lincoln, and Madison. And what's been really great about this project is I've started to um, share some of this with the other cities. And the, the first mayor I spoke with is Mayor Troxell, who we'll hear from later. And he said, I, I know. He said, I know, I know all this happens. I've been thinking about it for, for a long time. He's a um, uh, uh, mechanical engineering professor at Colorado State University and is now the mayor. Um, so, of course, he would understand this. Um, totally makes sense. And so I'm going to do the, the boring part um, and talk through a little bit of data. Um, the rest of the day will be uh, data-free. Largely. Well, except for Ed Blazer. He's going to have lots of data. <laughs> then it'll be largely data-free. Um, and I want to go through, share with you what I found um, during this benchmarking project because it really is extraordinary. And it, it makes you think about um, Lexington and these university cities in a, in, a, in a very different way. These numbers are, are stark. So this is something you'd expect, right? That uh, with 10% of your population of students, you'd expect that your average age would be, uh, mean age would be, would be younger. And you'd expect that you'd have a more highly educated um, uh, population. So this is the percent of uh, people living in, in the university cities with um, bachelor's degrees and above. So it's quite a bit higher, and it turns out that this drives a lot of effects that we'll hear 
about in just a bit from Professor Ed Glazer and Professor Ken Trosky. Here's some, one of the findings I thought was really interesting. So Lexington, it did feel like we did not suffer from the um, Great Recession as, um, as greatly as other cities. Um, and that showed up in, in the numbers. And what it turns out is that all the university cities grew coming out of the Great Recession at a rate that was nearly as, as rapid as the, the largest cities, the largest co coastal cities, um, and certainly much faster than other cities our size. And with that, as, as we'll hear later, what that does is it shows an adaptability um, in a city, uh, an ability to, to innovate. When you go through a, a correction like that, your economy shifts. Um, we've also done some, some further research that I'll, I'll share after the conference about the ability of university cities to shift their economies um, during recessions. We, we've done some, some research around that funded by the, the Knight Foundation, and it turns out that university cities are, that are able to, to shift their economies in a, in a measurably um, a deeper way through a recession, even though their economies may be smaller than larger metropolitan areas where you'd assume there'd be a little more, a little more play. Um, certainly lower unemployment. Uh, university cities tend to track uh, at least one, uh, often two points below uh, the, the national average in terms of unemployment, and this creates a, a, a solidity in the, um, in the economy. Uh, you'd expect that, again, with a large anchor institution and employer. Um, and full of ideas. So this is a measure, a, a standard measure of, um, of creativity, of business creativity, so patents per thousand. You'd expect that to be much higher in university cities uh, where uh, so much IP is, is being created. Um, but there's an interesting finding. There's a, a labor economist in, at Berkeley named Enrico Moretti, and what he found is that when you have uh, IP, lots of IP in a city, what happens is that companies that aren't even related to that IP tend to be more productive. And this is a theme I think you're going to hear a lot today. There's sort of a, a magic that happens um, in university cities, uh, spillover effects, I think is what uh, economists call them, um, where you have um, you have these positive effects, and it's not—it's not—it's uh, not often a direct. Um, it's not easy to see the direct relationship. So university cities are, are highly entrepreneurial. So we can look at the number of, of business starts in a city, and in the university city, the rate of business starts, the rate of entrepreneurship, is almost as high as the the largest cities in the country. So these are cities that are. Um, so sort of predisposed to creating new companies and to shifting their economies. This is one of my favorite findings. Um, so look at, in university cities, we can look at the number of arts and cultural institutions per capita. So museums, theaters, um, fun things, and it turns out that for university cities, um, the arts and cultural institutions per capita are just much higher than in other cities, even higher than the largest 15 cities. Um, if folks think that, uh, you know, in Lexington there's, there's lots to do, um, this, this is the, the, the data behind that story. And it turns out that university cities have incredibly low violent crime rates. Um, in, uh, in Lexington, our violent crime rate is um, among the lowest in the country uh, for any city of our size. And that's true of all the university cities. They tend to have um, much lower violent crime rates. And a thriving civil society. This is uh, a newer finding. This idea, you can look at nonprofits per capita in a city, so a measure of uh, the civil society and um, what uh, volunteerism and uh, all the, the great things we associate with, with nonprofits, um, much higher, much higher than in the, the largest cities in the country and in other cities. That creates a richer, richer city. And so with all these effects, it's really no wonder that people are becoming more and more attracted to university cities um, and are moving to them and wanting to, to stay uh, after they graduate. And we're seeing that in the numbers too. Um, the university cities are growing at about twice the rate of the nation. Um, people just want to just want to live there. 
and no wonder. So what does this mean? It means that these university cities, they mirror the largest cities in the country in really important ways, right? They've got lots of talent, lots of entrepreneurship. They have these resilient economies. Um, they have a large nonprofit sector. Um, but unlike uh, the large coastal cities, they're very low cost, very low crime, and low unemployment. So really, if you were thinking about designing uh, a city for the 21st century, it might look something like a university city. Now, we shouldn't pat ourselves on the back too much. We were horrible performers in the 20th century economy. Um, so that's when uh, the economy was good around manufacturing. It turns out it was, um, as Louisville knows, it was really important to have uh, a water source, right? A, a, a river or a port. Um, Lexington didn't have that, and its uh, population and the other uh, the other universities, the population growth was was not there. Um, but in the 21st century economy, when brains are more important than uh, uh, water sources, um, I think we can expect the um, the growth to, to continue happening. And now it's happening. And you'll see that as these university cities are uh, become magnets for talent and investment. One interesting thing, just from my vantage point in the in the mayor's office, um, Mayor Gray, what he um, big part of his day is sort of allocation of, of resources in some way. You know, what's the city going to be working on? What are we going to spend our time on? Um, but. And for other mayors, um, they're going to have to make much more difficult choices about where to allocate their resources. Do we want to try to build an entrepreneurial ecosystem, which is something we're going to talk about later today? Um, do we want to try to lower our <coughs> crime rate? Um, do we want to build our arts and culture sector and subsidize the arts and culture um, to make for a, sort of a richer, more interesting city? Um, a mayor can do that and can be maybe be successful with, with one of those things, um, but can't be successful in all of those things. And these are, this is the constellation of effects that just naturally happens in university cities. So that's why we think university cities are where the, um, the future is happening. So that's my um, uh, take on the, the data. Um, and what I want to do for the, for the rest of the day is um, we're going to explore the idea from a bunch of different angles. So we're going to have mayors um, talking about their cities and doing a policy swap. Um, we're going to have an expert on um, universities and how they connect with cities. Uh, panel of practitioners talk about entrepreneurship and innovation. Someone from the Brookings Institution who's going to be talking about um, uh, innovation districts that are anchored by universities. Um, but before we do all that, we'll um, shortly introduce our, our keynote speaker. Um, and before I do that, I want to just thank the, the sponsors of this event. So the Kresge Foundation um, was the, the first sponsor of the event, along with the Gang Center for the Humanities, which is an amazing resource at the University of Kentucky. This is the, the Lafayette um, Gang Seminar for, for the year. Then there's the, um, the Knight Foundation. Uh, which has uh, sponsored the conference, and something I'd like to announce right now, they have agreed to offer um, $10,000 in grants to any researcher, uh, um, student, or professor who wants to choose a, a topic within the idea of university cities and explore it. Um, there's more information on that at universitycities.org um, if there's anybody who'd like to, to apply for that. The deadline's November. Um, November 14th. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to introduce our keynote, Ed Glazer. Uh, professor Ed Glazer is the Fred and Eleanor Glimp Professor of Economics in the Faculty of the Arts and Sciences at Harvard University, where he has taught since 1992. He regularly teaches microeconomics theory and occasionally urban and public economics. He served as director of the Tavern Center for State and Local Government and director of the Rappaport, Center, uh, Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston. Um, his work is focused on the determinants of city growth and the role of cities as centers of idea transmission. Um, and that's where I first learned about um, Ed Glazer through his uh, book, Triumph of the City, and one of his earlier papers, The Skilled City. 
Uh, he received his PhD from the University of Chicago in 1992. And now I'm very pleased to welcome Ed Glazer. Thank you, Scott. Um, and thank you so much for including me in this amazing event. Uh, I think we can all agree that university cities are amazing places. And they are really places where the future of America looks brightest. Part of the great challenge is figuring out how to harness that magic in the service of the country as a whole. And that's part of what I'm going to be talking about today. So Daniel Patrick Moynihan, this quote is at the back of the brochure. It's, it's a remarkably prescient quote. When asked, how is it that you build a great city? He, his response was to build a world-class university and then wait 200 years. And uh, it turns out that he was right. Cities have endured. Cities have succeeded. Cities have thrived throughout the world. But not all cities have, have thrived. And university cities, skilled cities, cities that survive on their brains, are the cities that have done well. So what I'm going to try and talk about is why university cities. I'm going to talk about the interplay between the city and the region. We have six really interesting university cities highlighted that, that experience different parts of America and different roles to play in those parts of America. And then finally, I'm going to end by talking a bit about uh, how university cities reach their potential. Now, cities have come back, but of course, it has been far from uniform. What I'm showing you here is along the x-axis, along the horizontal axis, is the share of the population with a college degree. Along the y-axis, along the vertical axis, is GDP per capita across metropolitan areas. There is extraordinary heterogeneity in America, right, between places like Bakersfield that are very, very low in, in terms of formal skilling and very, very poor, to places like San Jose, California, that are extraordinarily wealthy and extraordinarily well-educated. Skills really are destiny. And the the reason why skills have become so important for cities is what saved cities in the 21st century, in the late 20th century, is that globalization and new technologies radically increased the returns to being smart. They radically increased the returns to being skilled. And we are a social species that gets smart by being around other smart people. In some sense, it is our greatest asset, is our ability to you know, be intellectual magpies, to, to steal ideas from the people that are around us. Right? It's what the great English economist Alfred Marshall was talking about when he wrote 120 years ago, that in dense clusters, the mysteries of the trade become no mystery, but are, as it were, in the air. Skilled cities, university cities, are places where there are more ideas in the air to be exchanged. They're places where it is easier to learn from people around us. You know, one of the things that's interesting about cities is that when people come to cities, they don't immediately become more productive. What happens is that year by year, month by month, they experience faster wage growth, which is really compatible with the view that cities are forges of human capital, places where we get smart by being around other smart people, and that particularly happens in university cities. Another word that I'm going to throw out is, is human capital externalities, which is the, the effect that happens that when we get smart by being around other people. Enrico Moretti is, is the scholar who's probably done the most to document these in recent decades. And, and the sort of fact is that holding your years of schooling constant as the share of adults in your metropolitan area with a college degree goes up by 10%, your earnings also go up by 10%. Now, um, not only are skills associated with earnings, they're also associated with growth. This is county level growth across the US. I've split America's 3,000 odd counties up into five bins, equally sized in terms of numbers of counties. And you can see pretty much all of the population growth has been in the most skilled counties of the US, really a huge gap. Of course, there's nothing particular to the US about this. If you look in the developing world, right, and I'm showing you here now results for Brazil, India, China, and the US, you see effects of local education that are, if anything, stronger. If you want to ask which cities in India, in Brazil, and especially in China, have managed to enter into the 21st century and thrive, they are the skilled places of the world. And we can do interesting experiments because not Chinese policy hasn't always been perfectly rational. Um, so one of the problems, of course, with, with uh, claiming that there's a skilled city effect is that skilled people may be going to places that are naturally successful. Right? That's probably not true in the case of university cities since these since these universities, these land-grant colleges were put here long before there was anything else. But you know, in the 1950s, China randomly reallocated academic departments for political reasons that were completely unrelated to anything that looks like common sense, at least the way I look at it. Um, and what you can then look 60 years later is the cities that got academic departments thrown in seemingly randomly have been doing much, much better than the cities that had them, had them removed. Um, 
So we're specifically shining a light on six university cities today. Six fairly amazing places, all successful in their own way, but all with different regions, all with different stories. So uh, we're, of course, here in Lexington, a city of about 318,000 people, 40% with college degrees, um, a, a regional success. Also something of what we call a consumer city, and I'll come back to this again. A place that actually attracts people who want to be here to live here, to be near the horses, to be near the rolling hills, not just because they're more productive here, but because it's be a beautiful place to be. Um, Durham Chapel Hill. Now, it was mentioned that these were not post-industrial cities. Durham is the only one of these that really does qualify as a post-industrial city. It was a, a giant in the tobacco trade in the 20th century. Um, and it has transformed itself into really one of the great hubs of the information age. Right? This, this region is really a tremendous success, and it also is the one that qualifies as being coastal. Lincoln, Nebraska, a state capital. Right? A place that is in the western heartland. I'll come back to this in a second. When you think about the flyover states of America, there really are two heartlands, the west and the east, and their fortunes have been very different. And both Lincoln and Fort Collins are in this western heartland that has had far fewer of the problems that have plagued the eastern heartland of the United States. Ann Arbor, Michigan, right? an amazing academic institution, a place that many people think could have saved Detroit if, in fact, the University of Michigan had actually been in Detroit as opposed to being... Uh, far too many miles miles away. Madison, Wisconsin, another state capital, another remarkably beautiful place. That's another thing that many of these cities have in common. And of course, Fort Collins, you know, arguably the most beautiful of them all in terms of, uh, and it's certainly also a consumer city. All six of them combine high education, high quality of life, right? uh, high, uh, and generally reasonable housing prices. And that's one thing that I'm going to come back to, that it is crucial that these cities be able to grow if they're going to power their regions. And one of the things to wa watch against is that they become as restrictive in their housing policies as many coastal cities do, where they zone out growth and ensure that those cities become boutique towns affordable only to the wealthy. Um, so let's look at some maps. So this is Wisconsin, and here I'm showing you unemployment rates. This is Dane County where the red line is, that's, uh, that's where Madison is, and you'll see they've ranked all the counties by education. Dane is not, not, you know, some relatively good performer. It's by far the best performer in all of Wisconsin in terms of, of unemployment rates. Really a, a spectacular uh, sign. This is Lancaster uh, County in Nebraska, so this is, this is Lincoln. Uh, here are incomes, and Lancaster, of course, is in the highest group of the Nebraska counties in, in terms of, of incomes. Uh, this is North Carolina, also uh, uh, income. Um, you have Orange and Durham counties here. Um, you know, bright green success over 10% above the na above the state average, as opposed to these great oceans of red that also exist uh, in North Carolina. Uh, this is southeastern Michigan. Again, you know, this is Ann Arbor in terms of income growth. It was already mentioned that these cities had done particularly well in weathering the Great Recession, and they, they have indeed. Uh, and you can see the sort of tantalizing distance between Ann Arbor and the suffering of Detroit. Right? And, and you know, Ann Arbor exists in this eastern heartland region that has been particularly hit by a post-industrial world. It provides a, a one vision of success in that region. Um, but of course, it's the spatial difference between Ann Arbor and Detroit makes it harder for the Detroit area to come back. And finally, I couldn't get any good maps of Fort Collins, but gosh, it is beautiful there. And, uh, uh, and you know, Colorado State is a great educational asset as well. And this is a place that you know every other city on the list recognizes that, that this is a you know this is a consumer city to beat. This is a place that attracts people for for lifestyle. Um, now we're in Kentucky, which in some sense is the most. Uh, it feels like the most riven apart state in the union, right? It feels like the most unequal, diverse place. Where you have places like Lexington, right, and you see in the center of the state, the dark blue means is education, the big red means income, right? It's relatively prosperous, it's extremely well-educated, it's a place that's full of vision and energy, and you see a future for, for you know, Kentucky and for America, and then you see the areas in eastern Kentucky or southeastern Kentucky. You know, these are huge gulfs between an, uh, shares of adults with more than 40% college degrees versus shares of adults with less than 10% with college degrees, and yet this is all within the state of Kentucky, enormous diversions. This is another place that makes it even starker. So this is life expectancy at birth, and that's you know, one of the many things that go along with education is you know, 
death. Uh, uh, so, you know, the gap is between 78 years in, you know, Fayette or Shelby, my own Kentucky ancestors lived in Shelby, um, to areas where you have seven years, eight year life expectancy gap, just enormous and, and, and tragic. And this west-east divide in some sense mirrors the larger gap between the eastern and western heartland of the U.S. And I'm particularly obsessed with non-employment of prime age males in America. I think in some sense it's America's largest unsolved social problem. We've gone from a world in which when I was born 50 years ago, less than 1 in 20 prime age males were jobless. Right? And that had been by and large the post-war norm. Today it's you know, more than 15%. Right, over 50 years, there's been a constant secular increase, goes up a lot during downturns and then moves back slightly, but joblessness continuing to rise. And I think it's really important when you think about inequality in this country, that in fact, joblessness is a far worse curse than earning a little bit less. If you look at measures of human misery, if you look at un unhappiness, if you look at suicide, if you look at divorce rates, if you look at illness, joblessness is just an incredible curse on America. Um, and it is a curse that is disproportionately found in this eastern heartland, in states like Kentucky. But again, it's the eastern Kentucky, it's not the western Kentucky. In West Virginia, obviously, and in the deep south. Um, <laughs> These, this is the curse that goes along with joblessness, right? Opioid deaths. So this is drug poisoning fatalities, again a map. Again you see this eastern heartland standing out as being the region of America that is most troubled. And this is the larger regional picture that I'm trying to push. University cities are fantastic, but they will be far more fantastic if they are able to lift their entire regions, if they're able to do more for the whole uh, area around them. Um, this is rates of disability. So disability insurance is the public policy that accompanies uh, the rise, the rise in joblessness. Again, the same pattern, the sort of deep blue in the in the eastern heartland. So I'm going to show you a few graphs of the divergence of three parts of America. And again, part of my point here is that America is not flyover states and then you know the coast. There are at least three major regions to think about: eastern heartland, western heartland, and the coastal states. I'm going to divide that. This is sort of a funny division here. Um, I'm actually dividing by the year 1840. So the states that are included here are the states that were in the Union as of 1840 rather than, rather than afterwards. So in some sense, we're grouping on age and there, just in case you didn't believe me, these were the states as of 1840. Um, so, um Usually, I tend to think about sunbelt versus not sunbelt, so we're doing a slight division on that, but the sunbelt still is important. There's no variable that better predicts metropolitan area population growth over the 20th century than January temperature. Right? Now, there are a lot of things that are wrapped up in that, so one part of it is the fact that the sunbelt has had relatively pro-business policies over the last 60 years. So the work of Tom Holmes at the University of Minnesota compares those counties that are on pro-business sides of state lines to those counties that are on anti-business sides of state lines after World War II, finds huge industrial growth in the pro-business uh, sides of these, these state lines. Another part of it is being pro-mass production of housing. You cannot understand why Atlanta, Dallas, Phoenix, uh, you know, each added a million people between 2000 and 2010 as metropolitan areas without understanding that they make it very, very easy to mass produce housing, right? as opposed to Boston, San Francisco, Seattle, that do not. And it, it's not that you know, Boston doesn't grow because it's so unproductive. Is Boston doesn't grow because to a first order approximation, they allow exactly zero homes to be built in the greater Boston area. Um, which again, is something that educated people help make happen. So it's the curse of education is that they decide they want to keep things as they are and choke off regional growth. And I've seen this around me in Boston, which for all of its blue state love of affordable housing, does a terrible job of actually delivering affordable housing relative to red state Texas, which does a fantastic job of providing affordable housing, even though they didn't actually think that they were doing it other than not regulating. Um, but let's, let's face it, some portion of this is actually just sunshine. That as uh, trans transportation costs declined, as American businesses were freed up from being near those waterways, freed up from being near to the old transportation network that anchored the old Rust Belt, people moved to places that they wanted to live. And apparently they wanted to live in places that you know, were warmer. And I can say as a New Englander that I show, think that this shows a terrible lack of character on the part of America. Uh, but at the same time, there's no denying that it's, that it's a, a major factor.
fact, and it's something that actually goes along with the differences between these university cities, that they all have a slightly different character depending on where they are. And of course, Kentucky is fascinating because it's just on the edge of the Sun Belt, right? That it, it went from being not a right to work state to being a right to work state in, in you know, recent years. So um, one typography of the university cities is coastal versus Sun Belt. So Durham Chapel Hill is clearly Sun Belt and you know, it's benefited by both having rules that were pro-development and also by having lots of education and often the skilled Sun Belt places, the Austins, the Charlottes, the Atlantis, the Durhams are often the most dynamic parts uh, of America. Two are Eastern Heartland, Ann Arbor and Lexington. Lexington, of course, sort of on the, on the edge, um, but Ann Arbor, you know, in the midst of a, of a region of difficulty, finding its own success. Um, two are squarely Western Heartland. Uh, Fort Collins and Lincoln, and they're doing particularly well, but in generally successful states, right? In some sense, they benefit from the from the tailwinds that are benefiting them, but they have less of a you know less of a public role to play in terms of lifting up uh, difficult areas. Um, you know, and moreover, the success of the West is not foreordained. It's not it's not that you know they're not going to need skills. And I want to highlight Scott's point, and this goes back to the work of Finus Welch and T. W. Schultz in the 1960s. Often, you see the impact of skills most squarely in times of stress. That in fact. If everything's going well, you can get along without knowing a lot. It's when your region is hit that having skills really gives you the power to reinvent yourself. And Madison is mixed, right? It's on the edge of Western and Eastern, Eastern heartlands as well. So let me show you some, some graphs from coastal Western and Eastern heartlands. So this is this employment rate that I started with as being a big difference between the areas. Um, so going back to 1980, they're all looking pretty good. If anything, the Western heartland has a higher employment rate than the other regions. Uh, they've all declined somewhat. The Western heartland has actually been the most robust in terms of prime age male employment. And I, I should say I'm focusing on men not because in any sense uh, joblessness is a, is a bigger problem among men than among women, but it's less complicated. That in fact, female employment, female labor force participation has, has had a large arc over the past 70 years, and it just means something different, and actually interpreting it is, is somewhat more challenging. Um, okay, Eastern Heartland, you know, by far the worst performer of these areas, and the coastal states actually between the two on this, that actually the Western Heartland looks the best in this. Total GDP growth, again, coastal and Western Heartland buying neck and neck over the last 30 years. Eastern Heartland, woefully behind in terms of GDP growth of, of these areas. Um, manufacturing GDP growth, Western Heartland still way up ahead, right? And I'm very big on pushing the notion that the future of American cities is not about manufacturing, that in fact it's not, you know, in part because manufacturing is just very space intensive. When Henry Ford was innovating 100 years ago, his industrial workers needed about 200 square feet per person. Today, car factories use 2,000 square feet per person. And you can imagine a factory with 200 square feet per, per person in the center of Detroit. You just can't imagine one with 2,000 square feet per person doing it. And you know, American manufacturing will continue to thrive, but it will thrive in a very capital, very technology intensive way, not one that's providing tons of employment for less skilled Americans. Um, Eastern Heartland, of course, the poorest performer in terms of this. GDP per worker, here the coastal states uh, stand out as being the highest performer, but still a little bit of room between Western and Eastern Heartland. And working population growth, here, the Western Heartland is way up in front. Um, you know, it's the area that has had the fastest population growth over the last uh, 40 years for the U.S. And this is the last one, again, getting back to the tragedy uh, that lurks in the heart of many, many American states. This is mortality. Uh, and for much of the period, you see declines. And then, particularly in the Eastern Heartland, it stops. And this is a fact that Anne Case and Angus Deaton have particularly emphasized. But the end of declining mortality for prime-aged American males. Um, now, that's not true everywhere. The coastal states have done fine in terms of mortality. The Western Heartland has done fine. It's the Eastern Heartland that has been the absolute disaster on this. One final thing, this is the change in the employment rate. So you can see, you know, Michigan and Kentucky are both places that have, have look among the worst in the, in the country in terms of declining employment rates. Uh, Louisiana being, uh, and Mississippi being a particularly extreme. This is drug poisoning fatalities by state. You can see Kentucky's uh, way up there, a little bit below West Virginia. But of course, you know, states in the Western Highland, like Nebraska, are at the opposite extreme. Right? So just a very different regional context for these, these university cities. Now, my model of regional growth is very simple. It's about schools and rules. Right? It's my model of national growth as well. It's about having institutions that favor entrepreneurship, employment growth, right? and it's about having skills. And you can succeed with as long as you have some kind of good combination of these two areas. So this is education. 
Um, and you know, this has been the big secret of coastal success. Massachusetts manages to do reasonably well despite having rules that are deeply inimical uh, for e in economic growth, despite basically saying, you know, saying no to every entrepreneur they could possibly say no to, uh, they manage still to grow because of their, because of their skills, right? Texas manages to grow with less education, but because they have rules that are very pro, uh, pro growth. Both strategies tend to work, and the right answer is to find some sort of sweet spot between the two, uh, between the two, uh, the balance the two. This is, um, education for the three regions. So you can see that the Western Heartland started out with a real benefit real educational advantage over the eastern heartland. Um, the coastal states, however, have moved ahead much more quickly in terms of education. And this is one of the big challenges that I lay on the, on the, you know, on the heads of the, our representatives of the university cities in, in the western heartland, right? That educational growth has slowed in those areas. Those areas which were the birthplace of the high school movement in the US, right? The university cities of the Western Heartland need to keep making the case that education is the secret sauce that fuels regional growth. They need to keep on emphasizing that just as they do in Kentucky. The Eastern Heartland has had some catch up, but it's starting from a lower base. And that's been part of the challenge. And of course, the places that started with less education were hit by this manufacturing transformation. So this is coal mining uh, in Kentucky. And I, I like this graph because it shows us that what's happened in Kentucky over the last 40 years is not that we stopped mining coal in Kentucky. They're still mining plenty of coal. They just don't use people to do it in the same way. Now that's not, you know, that's not necessarily a terrible thing. My, my wife's grandfather was, was mining in Eastern Pennsylvania and he went into the mines at 11 and died at 59. And you know, he was well paid for that. He put two daughters to college. With, with that, but that was a tough life, a brutal life. But we need to figure out other things for prime age males to do, almost assuredly in the service sector. The problem with that is that, you know, we middle-aged men are, are not always so great at being nice to people. And part of the critical element of success in the service sector is actually being nice to people. Um, so that's employment. Another problem, obviously, is new technologies like opioids. So opioids comes in and hits. This is not just any opioids. These are uh, generic opioids. So these are particularly cheap opioids. So this is, uh, uh, which have come in, hit areas of misery, hit areas in which we had a welfare state that supported people going on disability and having, uh, paying for prescriptions. And these ended up being a terrible scourge that we didn't think through. And it's often the case that when you have existing social problems, you add in something new, some new opportunity, it can actually make things worse. I think about the terrible rise in mortality after Russia opened up to the West in the 1990s, where rising income led to a great, you know, a, a great alcohol uh, binge that ended up causing the lives of, of Russians to get shorter, not longer. Um, and of course, this is one measure of the welfare state. These are uh, federal government expenditures per capita by state. And you can see that these are particularly ha high in the areas, again, of the Eastern Heartland, uh, places that were hit by post-industrialization. And often those federal benefits, while well-meaning, right, can have unfortunate counter effects. Right? The way that disability taxes employment is deeply problematic, and there's great work that's been done on Norwegian reforms of disability that enabled disabled workers to actually take home more of the cash benefits of the earnings that they take. And they've shown that the disabled workers have actually gone back to work in larger numbers uh, as a result. We should rethink those incentives. Um, schools and rules. So again, the Eastern Heartland looks unique in terms of rules. This, these are measures of corruption by state. Corruption is actually strongly correlated with education. Um, the way we typically measure corruption by state is with federal cases against local officials. So, you know, a properly corrupt state will not police its own, obviously. So you can't count on, you know, Louisiana DA is taking on Louisiana officials, but the feds will go after them. So these are usually federal, federal cases per capita. Uh, this correlates negatively with economic growth at the local level, correlates negatively with education at the local level. Um, and, you know, this is the, this is the area. And, and this is, you know, I'm not saying that fighting corruption is the most important thing, but it's indicative of the political problems that often build up over time, uh, particularly in places with education uh, deficits. So what went wrong with the Eastern Heartland? I think from Louisville North, the region inter industrialized early, which meant both less appetite for public schooling, right? Because you could go into the factory early on, you didn't actually need public education. It also meant you didn't have off seasons that the farm kids did in which you could educate kids. In South, the cotton economy and the legacy of slavery limited investments in schooling as well. Um, low education is associated with more corruption. And I just want to quote Thomas Jefferson on this. If a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. I think Jefferson is right on this. The correlation between education and democracy is strong. It's hard to make a really strong causal link there. But you know, human capital tends to defend its institutions.
institutions. And that's another role for university cities, right? Political engagement, political improvements, not just Mayor Gray's office, but the, the state fighting to make sure that Kentucky and Wisconsin and Nebraska are as well governed as they could possibly, as they could possibly be. Um, limited political corruption in the one party south enabled, enabled corruption. And of course, Manker Olson in his, in his work sort of brilliantly emphasized the way that institutional rent seeking corruption of a variety of forms tends to accrete over time, right? And in some sense, the Western heartland benefits from being newer. It has less of these negative institutions that have built up. The coasts, of course, have plenty of them, but in some sense, the stronger educational of, of many of the coastal cities has enabled more of a fight to occur. Um, okay. and. Uh, you know, while corruption is a hard thing to take on, things like extra licensing requirements, things like various barriers to entrepreneurship, those are easier to take on. This is a map of, which again shows the Eastern Heartland pattern, um, states that have to license opticians versus not. You know, uh, it's clearly really important that opticians be licensed because they might, you know, give you a, a frame which doesn't really look right on your face. They might give you a round frame when you actually need a square frame or something like that. Um, so it's really important that we have this licensing. The rise of occupational licensing has been a national phenomenon. And it's one that we have never really properly put, put through cost-benefit analysis. You know, please don't think that I am, have any sort of you know, knee-jerk opposition to all forms of regulation or all forms of licensing. Much of my work is on the cities of the developing world, where I am a strong advocate of various regulations around real sanitary reforms that actually need to occur in these areas. And certainly, I, am, I was in favor of more, not less, banking regulation after 2007 in, in the US. But there are things, like opticians, that actually don't need to be licensed. And you know, food trucks, for example, which are a great way of delivering low-cost foods by innovative entrepreneurs in urban areas, I, I, you know, I see no reason why we can't make it easier to, to permit food trucks. And yet so many cities make it difficult. Why? Because they're protecting insiders. And that's exactly the story of Detroit, where I was engaged in this, this NPR show about five years ago for this cause celebra, which is the Pink Flamingo, this poor woman who had been trying to start her food truck in Detroit for 18 months. Now, and, you know, she hadn't been able to get through the regulatory uh, web. Now, the idea that Detroit should be saying no to any entrepreneur who wants to get started is just absolutely insane. Um, but so we're on this NPR show. They've also got the city ombudsman. And after an hour, right, of, you know, I'm beating up on the guy, she's beating up on the guy, the host beating up on the guy, every caller is unanimously beating up on this poor city ombudsman who's just trying to do his job. He says, oh, the lady, go ahead and just start your food truck. We'll never catch you. Uh, <laughs> um, and the, the, the larger point, right, is that we make it far easier in this country to be a, you know, a rich person entrepreneur than to be a poor person entrepreneur. If you want to start your internet startup and operate in cyberspace, no one's going to stop you. If you want to start a food truck or a bodega or an ordinary coffee shop that sells milk products, at least in Boston, you've got 18 permits to go through, right? And we have a need for one-stop permitting, people who speak the languages of the people in the areas, and people and having permitting czars who can be judged by the speed with which they deliver answers. Um, okay, human capital is more important than physical capital. Right? This is a general theme that I'm going to make. That, that in fact, the response often to declining regions is to invest in infrastructure. You heard it again in the latest, latest election. Now, we actually do need to invest in maintaining our infrastructure. This is not what I'm, I'm saying. And there are smart infrastructure investments that we can make. But thinking that infrastructure is going to save declining regions like Appalachia was a mistake 50 years ago, and it remains a mistake today. Right? So this is a map of the Appalachian highways. Uh, this is from work that I did about 10 years ago. Yes, there was a bump up in the 1970s from being part of the Appalachian regional area. Again, we're using a, a way of trying to, to e find reasonably comparable counties to compare. Over the 30 years, it made absolutely no difference, at least in our finding, that all of these infrastructure-heavy policies did very little. And you see this in individual cities, right? You know, seeing things like Detroit's people mover monorail, right? Which is an atrocity that glides, you know, over, emptily over empty streets. What Detroit needed was better schools and safer streets for its kids. It did not need some form of Disney World-inspired, you know, uh, infrastructure to, to help itself. Um, what we need is better schools. And Kentucky has been active in the space of school reform for 30 years. For 30 years, governors of Kentucky have argued with this, but the pace has been slow. And that's been true everywhere. This shows ACT scores by year. Small take-ups, they're bounce back when more people take the ACT. That isn't a sign that things are going badly. But the path is, is slow. And this is an area in which university cities play an absolutely critical role, because we need ju not just education that's lifting the bottom, but education at the top. We need those new ideas that are responsible for new economic growth, for new
new economic development. So why do university cities matter? I think most importantly, the right economic development strategy at the local level is to attract and train smart people and then get out of their way. Universities do that. They do that with their students, they do that with their faculty, they do that with affiliated businesses. It's their most important role. They create spin-offs from relevant research, and I'll talk about that in a, in a second. They have a global outlook. In some sense, you know, the successful cities of the early 19th century, just like the successful cities of the early 21st century, are marked by three things. Smart people, small firms, and connections to the outside world, right? Very different from the industrial city of 1910, but that is the future. University cities have that. They have the capacity to fo foment entrepreneurship, they, and they always have a global outlook. Almost every serious academic is well-traveled, has some degree of connections to the outside world. Um, quality of life improvements. We already heard about the great cultural institutions that are, are in university cities. Sometimes helpful policy and political engagement, which is not to say that every policy idea that comes out of an academic's mouth is necessarily the most sensible thing in the world. Uh, so it's usually a combination of good and bad. And sometimes evaluation of policy experiments, right? So uh, evaluating schools, evaluating entrepreneurship programs. So let's just talk about a little bit of evidence. So there's a great deal of cross-sectional evidence suggesting the power of universities and the power of skills more generally. Enrico Moretti is is probably the largest player in this. I've been engaged with some of this with uh, Albert Saez. Um, and typically what we do is we look at the presence of land-grant colleges prior to 1940 in, in areas, and, and that correlates quite strongly with success. There's a, a long literature on patent spillovers from local universities showing businesses that, pat that cite patents that were originally in the university. Um, and I'm also going to show you some evidence from my former student, Naomi Hausman, on the role of universities in inculcating business startups after the Bayh-Dole Act. Um, there's, I'm not going to show you that, but there's great evidence on, on university openings in the 1960s in Germany by Simon Yeager of MIT. i uh, show you a little bit on Boston and the story of Silicon Valley. So first of all, just the general skills. In fact, this is US primary employment by, by schooling. This is the relationship between colleges per capita and in 1940 and share of the population with a bachelor's degree in 2000. Okay, a fairly strong, although albeit far from perfect correlation. One of the things that happened with colleges in 1940 is this great sorting of America that places that were initially more skilled got even more skilled. And what you're looking at here along the horizontal axis is the share of the population with a college degree as of 1940. What you're looking at along the vertical axis is the growth in the share of the population with a college degree between 1940 and 2000. So the places that had an initial skill advantage saw that skill advantage explode over the next 60 years. So uh, that's what you're looking at here, right? Is this very large uh, correlation. So the places like Lexington that had a little bit of an edge really benefited from that over the next 60 years. Same thing true for Lincoln, for Durham, for Fort Collins, for Ann Arbor. Um, these are regression tables that say what I basically just said in words, that places with more universities, more land-grant colleges in 1940 end up having higher wages, higher housing prices, Prices, higher population growth. Um, now, Naomi's work looks at the Bayh-Dole Act. So prior to 1980, you could not patent research that was funded with federal grants. After 1980, you could. This shows what's happened to university patents over between 1976 and uh, to 1997. And during the 1970s, before the Bayh-Dole Act, it was really pretty flat. It was really pretty sleepy. And then suddenly the Bayh-Dole Act said, you know what, this stuff, you could commercialize it. Go ahead. Go start your businesses. And suddenly you see university patents exploding over time. Right? This is an almost five-fold increase over a less than 20-year period. And what we see is that by focusing on the industries that the university was strong in prior to 1980, we can ask, were there spillovers to local businesses? And that's exactly what Naomi does. She finds that there's a whole rush of openings of businesses in the areas the university had been good at, but had previously been prevented from, from capitalizing on. So places like Bozeman, Montana, which had been sleepy in 1980, suddenly had a whole bunch of startups in industries that were related to the college. And certainly, we see this in every one of the university cities that we're talking about. The research triangle around Durham is particularly prone to this. Um, we see this in Massachusetts as well. This is just the regression format, where you know our, everyone know our land-grant college? Our land-grant college is called the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, right? MIT is our own land-grant college. So anyone who says that land-grant colleges can't be great at commercializing research, you know, just visit Kendall Square, right? It's all about commercializing, it's all about commercializing research, and they do spectacularly well. What you're looking at here is the concentration of tech firms in greater Boston. There are two 
great centers, one of which is the Route 128 corridor, which in some sense is the old center. Right? It's a center that's grounded by highways, by large office parks, but it's a center that even then had its start in MIT because the ER company for this was Raytheon, which was founded by Vannevar Bush, who was a great MIT scientist. Um, and of course, the new tech center is the, is Kendall Square, is the area around MIT, a place that felt like it was sleepy and dying 25 years ago when I came, came to Harvard, where my predecessors at Harvard declared that unless the federal government bailed out Cambridge's candy industry, because of course we had been the candy capital of New England, Necco Wafers, New England Confectionery Company, uh, right, dying, unless it got bailed out, you know, Cambridge would never, never survive. All of those candy factories now have biotech firms in them, right? They're all, they're all well occupied, they're all thriving. And, you know, they're a slightly different model. Uh, can Kendall Square has, you know, tends to have more small firms, but um, uh, Kendall Square has had more growth in small establishments, Route 120 has had more growth in big establishments. There are different models. One is highly walkable, one is highly dense, the other one is more car oriented. Both models can work, right? America is great in some sense because it has a variety of different ways in which people can live. And great cities are archipelagos of neighborhoods where people can choose different areas. So I think the key thing in terms of the future of all these university cities is thinking about having different pockets that can accommodate different types of businesses. Um, Entrepreneurship right, is a very hard thing to measure, but it is remarkable given how mediocre our measures are of entrepreneurship that they do such a good job of predicting urban success. One of those measures is average establishment size, right? so having lots of little firms in an initial time period. Another is the share of employment in startups in an initial time period. So what you're seeing here is across American metropolitan areas, the relationship between small establishment sizes and employment growth. Massive difference, right? Massive difference between those places that looked like they were more entrepreneurial for years ago uh, and subsequent growth. This is not just about region. This holds within every metropolitan area. It holds across industries. It holds however you want to look at it. Um, and it also holds if you use things like the existence of mines in an area in 1910, because mines tended to mean big business. And those big businesses tend to crowd out smaller businesses. And the places that benefited from access to coal and iron uh, 100 years ago have paid the price today and that they've had very large firms that have crowded out uh, entrepreneurship. Now, uh, coming to the end here, and I, I want to end on, on one story and then just talk a little bit about things that I think the university cities can do. But in some sense, that's going to be the topic of the rest of today is things university cities can do. Um, I want to start with the story of Stanford which it's hard to think of a more successful university in the public realm than Stanford, especially as an economic engine. Silicon Valley rests on Stanford, right? This great economic engine for America rests on Stanford. And it reminds us, of course, you know, because there's no region that is more restrictive of housing in Silicon Valley, of what a terrible thing it can be when a region succeeds economically and then basically says that no one else can move in, right? And, you know, start our home, start at two million bucks. And, you know, this in some sense is the opportunity that all of these university cities have, but they're facing this type of, of housing, but you know it's it's a tragedy that we in fact can't move to the most productive places in America the way that we did 100 years ago, the way that we even did 50 years ago. Um, so that's Leland Stanford, and the key element with Leland Stanford's vision and the thing that made him different from John D. Rockefeller at the University of Chicago, where both Ken and, Ken and I went, was Leland Stanford wanted a practical university that would be engaged with businesses that were relevant then. He was not interested in the classics. He was not interested in some East Coast Europe-looking vision of what a university could be. He wanted a university to be like himself, a practical man of business, a railroad man, a governor. Um, and that's what he got. And so Silicon Valley really starts when a telegraphy genius, a teen genius named McCarthy, dies in a freak streetcar accident in San Francisco at the start of the last century. His backers say, well, you know, it's a shame this genius died on us, but, you know, we've got this money here. We'd like to give it to somebody else. We'd like to see somebody else, this telegraphy thing, it's going to do something. We want to, we want to invest in it. So they call, who do they call? They call Stanford's engineering department. And they say, who, who do you have who could lead this effort? And you know, the, the professor that they called pointed them to his star student, Cyril Elwell, who takes the money, right? He looks at McCarthy's ideas, he, he sees that they, they won't work, and then he goes and he contracts with Waldemar Polson, the Polson arc telegraphy uh, technology of the early 20th century, and Federal Telegraph is formed. And you can see the graph here, which is the, uh, it says it's the original site of the lab laboratory and factory of Federal Telegraph Company, founded in 1909 by Cyril Elwell, here with two assistants, Lee DeForest, inventor of the three-element radio vacuum tube, Devised in 1911 to 1913, the first vacuum tube amplifier and oscillator. Right? This is where it starts. Not after World War II. It starts a, you know, a, a full hundred years ago, and it starts with clear routes to Stanford. Federal Telegraph is there when the young Fred Terman 
right, who his father is one of the developers of the Stanford Binet IQ test, the young Fred Turman gets summer jobs working for Federal Telegraph. He then goes off to MIT, he studies under Vannevar Bush, he comes back, he becomes a professor and dean at Stanford, and after World War II, he starts Stanford Industrial Park. He starts this great investment in the future of the region, and he attracts William Shockley, to come and, and run his uh, semiconductor operation there. Shockley turns out to be the perfect entrepreneur to jumpstart a regional ecosystem because he both attracts talent and then repels it, right? It's exactly what you want, right? He brings in, because he is brilliant, because he is a Nobel Prize winning scientist, he brings in this extraordinary cluster of genius and then you know, within a year, he's alienated them all with his behavior. So they're all gone off, they first start, start join Fairchild and then they disperse, they become the Fairchildren. And it is in their genes, it is in their, their uh, creativity that they then make Silicon Valley. In the 1960s, Silicon Valley was not marked by big office complexes. It was small companies, they were nimble, they talked to each other, they met at Walker's Wagon Wheel. They showed the power of ideas to make a regional economy grow, which is ultimately what we're all talking about in terms of university cities. Um, the, uh, the, the region even, well, we won't talk about Facebook um, and, and Cambridge Mass. That's, that's a sore, uh, that's of course a sore spot because Facebook reminds us that, you know, the greatest thing that cities do is to enable these collaborative chains of creativity that powered humanity's greatest hits since, you know, Socrates and Plato bickered on an Athenian street corner, right? That's still going on around us. It's going around on us in lots of different ways. Often we see it most clearly in the arts, right? You can often see these chains in things like the, the Florentine Renaissance. So, you know, this starts with Brunelleschi's understanding of linear perspective, how to make two-dimensional shapes seem three-dimensional. Brunelleschi passes it along to his young friend Donatello, who puts it on low-relief sculpture on the wall of Orson Michele, who passes it along to Masaccio, who puts it in you know, the Brancacci Chapel, marvelous painting of uh, St. Peter fighting a silver coin in the belly of a fish, passes it along to that less than St. Imanc Fra Filippo Lippi, passes it along to Botticelli and so forth, a chain of genius, each person riffing on each other's ideas. Right? This is what smart cities do that actually matters. Right? Now, Facebook is another example, and I don't want to get into intellectual property dispute here. It seems to be an example where Harvard's halls also enabled the flow of ideas which led to collaborative creativity, right? And in some sense, it continues to show the power of face-to-face -face contact and powering innovation. Unfortunately, Cambridge couldn't keep that, right? And he was drawn in by this great Silicon Valley ecosystem. You know, one of the things that I'm always asked about is, do I think that all this new technology will make face-to-face -face contact and the cities that enable that contact obsolete? And I think the, I thought the answer was no 25 years ago when I first started working on this, where it seemed far less obvious, and I certainly think it's no today. And one of the most strongest pieces of evidence we have about this is that of all the industries in all the world that should be enabled to empower long-distance communication, right, the number one should be Silicon Valley, should be tech. And yet Google doesn't say, go home, just dial it in, just work from wherever you want to be. They build the Googleplex. No, they don't build. They buy the Googleplex. They buy a million and a half square feet in downtown Manhattan, right? They bring people together and want them to be right on top of each other 24 hours a day constantly communicating with each other because that's what information does. That's how information grows. You know, anyone who's ever taught knows the hard part about teaching is not knowing your subject matter. It's knowing whether or not anything you're saying is getting through to your students, right? And we have evolved over millions of years for having these cues that communicate comprehension or confusion that are lost when we're not in the same room with one another. The more complicated the world is, right, the more important it is to get those ideas across, to have the benefits of face-to-face -face contact, which is why there's no sense in which I believe that long-distance learning will be a challenge to the great universities of the world. And there's no sense that I believe that long-distance communication will make the smart cities, the university cities of the world, in any sense obsolete. Finally, what can university cities do better? I think we're going to hear a lot about that today, but I'll just say a few things that have seemed, you know, that seemed obvious to me. First of all, there is a notorious tendency, and I come from one of the world's global capitals of town gown acrimony. Uh, there, there is a long-standing tendency of, of universities and their cities not to get along. So I've seen none of that here in Lexington. I was, I was delighted to see. But it, it, is, it is an ongoing challenge. And figuring out ways for, that are both in the university and the city's interest to collaborate, right? in ways that enable university researchers to help evaluate city projects, that enable cities to um, actually see benefits from participating with the university is really crucial. 
Um, universities can encourage useful skills and entrepreneurship. Universities don't always do this, right? But they can actually pay a little bit of attention to actually doing the sort of things that people do in business schools, which actually promote people to actually do things that involve, involve work. Which is not to say that you know, things that don't look useful aren't useful in lots of different ways, but being actually engaged with the world around you is actually valuable because we all have the capacity to learn from, from around us. Cities can focus on quality of life for young graduates and not putting barriers in the way of building. So very few of the you know, kids who come to Boston feel like they're bound together with the Boston metropolitan area. And that was seen as really a lost opportunity. I, I chaired the Citizens Commission for the Future of Boston at the behest of the President of the Boston City Council maybe 10 years ago. And it was amazing how many young kids just felt that the city government didn't care a darn about them. Right? That sense of you know, empowering the, the, the kids, making them feel like they're actually tied to Lincoln, Lexington, uh, Madison, Ann Arbor, uh, is really crucial for the retention strategy. Which is not to say that the retention rate should be 100%. Universities are meant to be export industries. They're meant to be taking, taking people in and then, then letting them go. But I think most university cities would like to retain a little bit more. And building some sense of, of community uh, there is valuable. And then the last question is, are the rules right for students to engage in local entrepreneurship? Students are such, you know, they have so much energy, they have so much enthusiasm, so many of them want to be part of an entrepreneurial ecosystem. The question is, has the university and the city created the rules that are right for them to actually engage and for them to be, them to be helpful? So let me stop there. I think we're going to hear a lot you know, more in terms of great ideas for making, making university cities even more productive. Let me thank all of you for being engaged uh, with this today, and thank all of you who are engaged in whether or not you're building up your university or building up your cities. Thank you for all that you, uh, that you do on this. Because, in fact, university cities are not just vibrant, successful places. I actually believe they may well be the best hope for America. And I, I want to just sort of end with that, that, in fact, you know, it's easy in a university city to be complacent. You saw the data. It all looks good. That's great, right? It's wonderful that the university cities are doing so well. They are a sign of what can succeed in urban spaces. But not all of America is doing so well. And university cities will only truly succeed if they don't just succeed for their own members, but they actually power the entire region around them. They bring up, they bring up the wider area. So let me, let me end on that and then open it, open it up for questions. Okay, so Scott, what do we do? What do we do on this? Uh, you guys, you guys seem to have it under control. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, we'll run a mic to you. Yeah, and if you don't have questions, I'll start cold calling. So, uh, it's, uh, yes, sir. Hi, my name is uh, Logan Gardner. I do research at the Wharton School. Um, so my question is. Uh, well, to frame it, at the end of the month, the Lexington City Council votes on the City Planning Commission's recommendation to not expand our long-standing urban services boundary. Um, in your book, you characterize NIMBYism, so not in my backyard, um, with what you call the National Law of Conservation. When environmentalists stop development in green places, it will incur in brown places. Um, so. Yet, a big chunk of our local economy and identity is in the horse industry. To protect the horse farms, our intangible assets, we must restrict development. What recommendations do you have for striking the right balance? So I think, I think you've said it exactly right, that, that balance is really critical here. So while in general, uh, I certainly am, because I, I live in one of the most nimbious places on the planet, uh, I almost universally stand on the side of allowing more development in greater Boston. And I would say the same thing for San Francisco and for New York as well. It's not as if you know, I'm in favor of, of allowing every restriction on development to go down. And there really are trade-offs. Let me actually not answer on on the growth boundary on Lexington yet, let me start with historic preservation, which is always a challenge, right? That um, some historic preservation is actually quite valuable, right? Some of it creates character in an area, creates beauty, makes the place magical, right? So, I mean, it's not as if the right answer is no historic preservation. But then again, not every ultimately utterly mediocre glazed brick building built on the Upper East Side of Manhattan after 1945, and I grew up in such buildings, deserves preservation too, right? So there's, there's a trade-off here. The question in terms of Lexington's growth boundary is, you know, uh, are there ways to balance growth, to balance affordable growth, with preserving the traditional beauty and charm of Lexington, right? So those horse farms are a real asset in the region, right? And they've, they've attracted wealthy people who have helped you know, and philanthropy and other things. So it's not as if, as if this is a, a, an easy thing to, uh, 
things you come up with. I think the right, the right answer is making sure that you have enough growth. If you're going to protect those, those horse farms, are you allowing enough growth in other areas? Are you making it as easy as possible to do infill development? Are you, you know, making it, making it possible for you to provide lots of homes for middle-income Americans to come, to come to Lexington while you're preserving that? If you can do that, then there's no conflict. You can do that. You can, you know, you can, you can have both, both things. If you can't, then you may have a trade-off. You may have to ask yourself whether or not the boundary has to be increased slightly. Uh, but again, there's no right answer here. You need to rigorously treat these things with cost-benefit analysis, not to say that there's one size fits all in terms of the right, the right answer. Um, so I think that's that's the best that I can do do on this. But you know, I, I'm sure I'm sure the mayor's team has it right. I, uh, they, uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'm David Goodnight, and I'm an uh, entrepreneurship professor here at the uh, University of Kentucky. And I've got a simple question for you. How do you shift the uh, mindset of faculty, uh, research faculty, from build it, they, it'll, they'll come, to prove it and grow it? So I think it happens slowly. Um, and uh, I'm not... You know, I, I usually speak on these. I, I usually feel that I have deep insight on you know the value of entrepreneurial hum, human capital because I am myself such a company man, and so I, I, and I come from generations of company. In my mother's case, women. Uh, so I understand what not having an entrepreneurial mindset looks like. Uh, and certainly, Harvard was for many decades among the least, uh, you know, least pro entrepreneurship uh, entities in terms of the, the main heart of the university. I mean, this was certainly during I mean, there are many things that I revere about Derek Bach during his his decades. But certainly he did not think the university should be involved in the marketplace in, in any meaningful, uh, meaningful way. Um, often it comes from the top. So often, you know, uh, a leader at the top of an organization can move things, and, and that's, you know, the easiest way for things to happen quickly. The other way it happens is, you know, uh, people start succeeding, and people get jealous of other people's Porsches, right? I mean, that's, that's the other, you know, way in which this happens. Now, it's a balance, obviously, and it's not as if you want every one of your faculty members to be focusing on their next startup relative to doing their own academic research. Um, but, uh, you know, in most, in most areas, the, there, you know, in particularly business areas there and technology areas, there's a lot to gain by by actually engaging with the real world and, and thinking about thinking about startups. And there's certainly the region has a lot to gain from it. So I think you know, uh, both top down and, and bottom up strategies make sense. And I think it's also helpful for you know local leaders to actually you know speak out at university events and say you know you know we're not asking for your money, we're just asking for your for your human capital. Just you know just just engage with our city. We're there. We want you to be part of the fabric of, of Lexington's economy. Let's let's help make a greater Lexington going forward. Other questions? Is there a difference? Sorry, is there a difference between being a um, university city and a college town? Because there seems to be a negative connotation to be a college town. I think, I think it's probably, if we like it, it's a university city. If we don't like it, it's a college town. That's probably right. Uh, uh, surely, university city suggests that it's, it's grown larger. It's not as parochial as we sometimes think a college town will be. So it's actually got stuff in it other than the university. So I think that's, that's one part of being a university city. So it's got to be engaged with, with the world in some larger, larger way. And I think that's, you know, all six of these university cities are, have more in them than just the universities. Um, and even if, you know, let's say, Perhaps the most the, one of them, which has a university that's most dominant, is Ann Arbor uh, in terms of just population uh, wise. But the University of Michigan is just so large and so dynamic that it's hard to possibly call Ann Arbor a, a college town relative to a university city. Um, so I think it, it has to do with the engagement, the outward looking nature of it, and the extent to which there's mixing in that. And I, I can't emphasize you know enough that you know when it comes to you know, if, if I think about sort of the first thing that we that we need for urban success, it's skills. The, the second thing is a particular form of skills, which is entrepreneurial human capital, right? And then the third thing is some degree of industrial diversity, right? The great you know, urban observer, Jane Jacobs, argued in the 1960s that, you know, new ideas were formed by combining old ideas. And cities that have a multiplicity of different ideas have different things that you can draw from, different things that you can combine, different industrial leaps that you can take. So think, for example, about Bloomberg, right? Michael Bloomberg is not a financial billionaire. He's an IT billionaire. 
Right, he's in information technology. In some sense, he's competing with the guys from Silicon Valley. He's able to compete so successfully with them because when he comes to start his business, he has run the trading floor at Solomon Brothers. He's run their tech operation. And he knows something that no Stanford-trained engineer knows. He knows what the guys at Merrill Lynch want on their desks. Right? He knows what he needs to deliver. And that knowledge, which the city's industrial diversity has given him, enables him to do a cross-industry leap. And that's, in some sense, what we're thinking about when we're thinking about university towns, is the cities that go beyond merely having a siloed one industry space, which is education, to being a broader uh, sweep than that. Okay. Other, other questions? Yes, sir. I'm John Thielen. I teach at the University of Kentucky. Uh, you get a lot of mileage out of the cases of Cambridge and Palo Alto in your profiles, but I don't see them included in our roster of university cities. How come? Oh, well, I didn't make that selection. Uh, um, <laughs> I think there, 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 I, I think there was a size cutoff that, that the, the metro areas are, are much bigger than, than that. There, there's certainly a, uh, well, Palo Alto is part of the San Jose metro area, the even larger San Francisco CMSA, which is, which is vast. So I think the, 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 if you thought about places that also can compete on, you know, on low cost of living, those are both two areas that you know, do worst in terms of, of, of that dimension. So you know, the, the, it's just the challenges are, the, the challenge for, for MIT is not figuring out how to connect the academy with the local economy. That challenge is met. The challenge is how to make, you know, how to make a city that more people can afford to live in and how to make sure that the benefits of that economic success spread to a wider range of the population. So it's just sort of a slightly different challenge, I think. But I think you know, we should be having a dialogue and we should be thinking about university cities more broadly. So I agree with your basic point. Okay, one, well, I'll go until Scott tells me to stop. But okay, one more. Let's, let's, uh, Actually, can I, take two, can I take two questions and I'll just answer one at the end? Okay, go, go ahead. The, uh... Hi, I'm Angie Mays. I'm a librarian and data nerd here at the University of Kentucky. My question is, how do we reach out to those people in the old economy whose skills have stagnated and fallen woefully behind the technology and analysis trajectories that have that power the modern economy kind of work. Great. And someone had the hand up right back there. If you can just, just, just speak, just say what you. Uh... Um, what cultural breakthroughs do we need? Sorry. Thanks. What cultural breakthroughs do we need, for example, uh, to attract uh, more people to move to university cities? Could we have, for example, a, a, baby, a baby Guggenheim here and in other university cities? Um, your question is somewhat somewhat easier. I think I think the um, the the you know as, as was already shown. I mean, the university cities typically start with being rich in terms of culture. Uh, I think the right thing is to continue with that, let that movement go forward, not to think about large you know uh, Star Architect kind of thing that comes that gets dumped in the middle of, of nowhere. I mean, even Bill Bow, which like won the lottery in terms of being insanely successful in terms of the museum, right? You know, it's an unemployment rate; it's 18% right now. Okay, which may be better than other parts of Spain, and perhaps it's not the disaster that it once was. And most attempts to sort of plop a museum down in nowhere end up like Sheffield in England, where you know they have a they, they built a museum about rock and roll history, which closed within the year. So you know, the arts really are not. It's lovely when the arts are supported by local government, but the arts is really best created by artists, not by urban planners, right? Who decide to just dump a, a museum somewhere. Now that again, you know, the two things go together, and it's a great thing when universities have art around them. But again, the creative impulses have to come from the bottom up. They, they can't come from the top down. You just you just can't legislate, you know, artistic genius. I mean, it just doesn't it just doesn't work. Um, your question is the much harder harder one, um, which is uh, especially retraining. So we we think about there being a skill mismatch in America. That in some sense is the root for the for the rising joblessness of prime age males. One part of this is handled among the very young. Is about pre K education. Is about you know lots of entrepreneurial investment for teens. You know more things that involve competitively sourced vocational training on weekends after school, where you don't just rely on you know the same tenured teacher to teach new technology skills, but you bring in other people. And the great thing about training someone vocationally is you can test whether or not a program worked or not right at the point of completion. You don't have to wait 10 years and look at the IRS records, right? So you can actually have a really real strong a really strong market in this. And if they do well, they succeed. And if they don't do well, you you shut them down. Um, 
Now, the harder part is retraining 50-year-olds. So we know something about training 17-year-olds. We believe that this can work. Or training 3-year-olds, even better. Retraining 50-year-old men. We've been trying to do various retraining programs for 50 years, Ken. And I don't know, would you, would you describe the, the general track record of these various forms of retraining programs as dismal or awful? Uh, it's, somewhere, it's somewhere between these. But the answer is we've been very, you know, teaching old dogs new tricks have proved, has proven to be extraordinarily difficult. And particularly middle-aged men and have done, you know, have done particularly poorly in the service in the service economy. Now, I think the right answer is learning by doing. I think more generally, in fact, you know, the, the model of, of learning by listening is a fairly fraught model at pretty much all levels of, of the age distribution. But I think it really has got to involve getting getting them back to work. And I think we should be open as a country to policies that raise the effective minimum wage, not by asking employers to pay for that, right, which you know will deter job creation, but rather by having a, something like the earned income tax credit that involves a wage subsidy that effectively boosts the wage that workers can take home uh, and tries to encourage them to get back into the workforce. But it has to be through, you know, I think it's got to be through work. I think it's not, it's not through retraining. It's by you know, getting employers who have an interest in, in hiring and getting them upskilled and finding useful employment for them. I think there's nothing else that's going to be successful on that. And with then, I will thank Scott for, for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you all for the university. Uh, I love following an economist, you know? <laughs> Everything was rational. You know, who got the Nobel Prize last week? Somebody that said we are irrational. And you can predict irrationality, okay? So that, that's more of what I am. But no, I have a deep appreciation for economics. Took a lot of it in graduate school. Uh, I visited my economics professor this summer in Boston. I told him all these things I do based on what I learned in economics. He pauses, he looks at me. I know what he's thinking. God, he got it wrong. <laughs> but, but still, I, I do these things and, and that matters. And I want to tell you, too, economists tell me that um, taste is something you, you usually you know, can't measure. Is that right, Ken, in economics? But uh, I violated that, too. My wife and I learned that I was going to be a finalist for this position. I'd never been to Lexington, Kentucky. So what did we do? Uh, the weekend before the interview, I think on a Tuesday, my wife and I flew here. And we walked around campus and the city for two days. Nobody knew who we were. We talked to perfect strangers, people who cleaned the grounds, students who were studying in the library, what's it like here, talked to people at restaurants, went to find the art museum on campus. You know, we went to look for all the touchstones that we were going to leave behind. My wife and I were very engaged in our previous community served on boards and uh, organizations, believe in paying our civic rent. And so we, we were looking for what, what are Lexington's taste? And, and can we find them here? And, and you can't find this in data. You, you gotta touch it and feel it. And so that was important. And that's a tribute to uh, this city and its long history because it attracted us. And we have an interesting history here. We've been around for 150 years. Bumpy rides at first. We started as an agricultural and mining college that was part of Kentucky University. And we were at Woodland Park, which is where Ashland Estates is, where Henry Clay's uh, home is today. Uh, there was some friction there. Um, but we, we apparently uh, broke up. And a lot of folks wanted to attract us to their community. Uh, I didn't realize this until we were preparing for these remarks that Bowling Green, Kentucky, wanted the University of Kentucky to reside, put a bid in. But I am grateful that Lexington and Fayette County won the prize, and they had to put some money down. Respectively, twenty dollars and $30,000 in bonds were issued. And we got this 52-acre site from which we grew this great campus. We were uh, located around Maxwell Springs, the house that uh, Phil, the, the, where we live is Maxwell Place, built in 1871, wasn't originally part of the university proper, um, but it is a home for the campus and a home for us. So this long association that began with Lexington, we're rooted in it, 
our futures are inextricably intertwined. They just are. We're in and of Lexington, and I want to talk about what that future, I believe, needs to look like. Now, downtown has always played a role in the University of Kentucky. It's where people first go. I did it on my sneak visit here. You know, where's the entertainment? Where's the arts? Where's the shopping? Where's the dining? You know, where's the vibrancy of a town? So you certainly have to go there. We used to have a streetcar. I think this is a good idea. We maybe need to bring this back. It used to come up to Main Street and stop. You know, that mass transportation is a good idea. I think we need to return to it. I'd get less complaints about two things, traffic and parking, you know. <laughs> so this works for me. And, and our administrators early on, we still fret over this a little, you know, we're worried about what kind of life our students would find downtown. So uh, Sarah Blanding, Dean of Women Students, used to, you know, go downtown to make sure students were not dancing at the Phoenix, which is where City Hall is now. It's uh, apropos. And, you know, people weren't congregating in certain places. Uh, we still worry about that a little today. But we offer this incredible set of rich opportunities together. So I, I have to tell you, you know, um, I was interviewed yesterday by a group of students, and somebody said, what is your typical day like? And not, none of them are typical, but my evening, I'll just share a bit of it. So I'm, I have a responsibility. I always get more invitations than I can fulfill. The Gluck Research Foundation, founded 30 years ago, we had a horrible uh, medical uh, crisis in our horse industry. Um, could have ruined the industry. Um, they turned to researchers at the University of Kentucky, and uh, it, was, it was a great success story, solved this problem. They formed this Gluck Foundation. People came together to, to permanently endow the research, to be forward-thinking, protect the industry, do the necessary research. So I go there. Where do we have it? It's because our student center is not ready yet. It's going to be beautiful, $210 million. Come back to see it. Uh, it'll invite you in, too. I did a, did a visit there this week, monumental staircase, all about building community, all about relationships, bringing people together. But it's not ready. So where did we go? Kroger Field, our football stadium. All right, we got the Woodward, Woodford Reserve Room, seated dinner there, lovely. While you're giving remarks, you can look out on the football field. 200 people doing yoga. Hey, this is the place I want to live. That's the kind of feel it had. And then I had to rush downtown to the Lexington Opera House. Why? Because something that started 20 years ago, uh, the Hope Center, thousands of homeless people uh, are, uh, have a place to go. We were celebrating their 20th anniversary. But who's part of that celebration? Besides powerful testimony of people whose lives, who, they look just like me and you, have been victims of an opioid epidemic and so forth. They've been turned around. But what's part of that evening? UK's world-class opera department providing the performances, you know, a source of inspiration. So that's what it's like to live here and to live in a university community. And you can't capture all that in data. But together, a city and a university can create that kind of atmosphere. And everybody in this room knows what we confront today and knows what a 21st century economy must create and collectively what kind of shared agenda we can have. So the other thing I like about living here is I can walk nearly anywhere I want to go. So I did, did my walking. I could go all the way to Kroger Field. I can get all the way downtown, and it's 25 minutes. You can keep moving, get all your steps in. It's great. So this morning, you know, because I worry about a lot of things, I get up early, get to walk to Starbucks. I would go to the one on campus, but our students, they don't get up till 8 o'clock. Starbucks doesn't open till 7, but the local one you can get to at 5.30. And what I always do, I carry my newspapers, still read those. And I, and I always want to look at the editorial page of the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. 
So what, what's on those pages today? Huh? Uh, regulation of gene therapy, regulation of speech, regulation of health care, regulation of immigration, decline of civic institutions, uh, responding uh, to um, one another and communities in disaster relief. Now, if that's not what a university is about, we can contribute to every one of those discussions. And the people who are going to have to answer those questions when we're all gone, those are the people who we hold responsibility for today. And that is a sacred responsibility. And you can't do it in isolation. I think the best places to offer those kinds of rich experiences are in places that have vibrant cities. So we are fortunate. So what do cities provide us? They certainly provide us a, an ecosystem, efficient, effective delivery of public services. We can't do all this alone. We have our police force, but we have to rely on the police force of the city, and they have to work in partnership. Same with everything else. You get that high quality of life I talked about through community spaces and activities around parks, history and culture, the creative arts. You get a branding and bolstering of recruitment in support of a place to live, a robust economy, entrepreneurial spirit that we both can share and grow on. And then there's something else a city can give you and a university participates in. And that's your moral compass. Because at the University of Kentucky, we want to welcome you. We want you to belong. And we want your respect for individuals, especially those different from you. Those who have a different history and perspective and life story. To be something you experience while you're here. And so what did we learn from our city this year? You know, there are better places for statues of Confederate generals than on the sacred ground where slaves were traded. So I salute the mayor. It was excellent leadership. You know, and, and we didn't move them in the middle of the night. You know, we tackled it and we had to work with people and all kinds of conversations had to be undertaken. And you know what? We, we, we're not airbrushing our history. We know more about it than we probably did before. And those are going to rest at a site that has a better context. So thank you again. And our students got to learn from all of that, right? Because those are the roles they have to play in the future. So we offer this beautiful and iconic resource. You know, when you fly in here, there's nothing more beautiful. And all the elements you need to have a rich experience for students and faculty are here. And I believe at the end of the day, it really takes two things if you want to grow. And that is talent and infrastructure. That's why when I came here, I thought, gee, we, we can rebuild a campus. We got this incredible talent. What more could we do with modern space? So what are we today? Because of my predecessors, uh, Lee Todd, they had this crazy dream 13 years ago. Uh, we were going to be the regional referral center for tertiary and quaternary health care. If you would have brought me in for a, as a consultant and I know something about these things, I would have said, you are crazy. Town of 300,000 people, you're going to be the referral center? We had 19,000 admissions to our hospital 10 years ago. We had 39,000. We did 45 heart transplants last year. That's 15th in the country. The city of over a million people down the road has all kinds of hospitals and all. Did seven. So you know what? They made it a reality, a far-fetched dream. It reminds me every day the importance of not dreaming too little dreams and all the hard work you have to undertake to make it come true. So we have all kinds of partnerships we work on with the city. The mayor and I, frequent text messaging going on. Uh, and it's, it's wonderful. 
So our, our arrangements with property and swapping land and all those kinds of things we did on uh, to preserve what we think is a core of a campus, but also give our city opportunity to grow. We've had $2.3 billion of construction here in the last six years. Only 10% of that came from the state. We did incredible public-private partnerships that were creative. This facility, the whole building, $65 million, all philanthropy. That science building that Phil mentioned that he likes to go to, the first philanthropist there, UK Athletics, $65 million. So we did all these creative things. But an, an important partner for us still is government. So the building I look forward to with greatest anticipation is our new research building. It's a $270 million structure. It's coming out of the ground now. It's already been framed up. And uh, the state said they'll pay for half and we'll pay for half. Now, it's going to have an economic development thrust because every one of those researchers are going to be, have to be nationally competitive and they're going to bring in external funds and create jobs and we can calculate all those. But the way we were able to convince the state of Kentucky to do that, I like to tell people I use two slides. I had visited Normandy in the summer. I saw a graveyard of 9,000 people. I then went to Eastern Kentucky where CDC Director Tom Frieden was speaking along with Congressman Hal Rogers. And Frieden showed a slide that said there were about 3,000 premature deaths just in eastern Kentucky every year from cancer, diabetes, stroke, opioid addiction, those kinds of things. And I said, holy cow, we are filling a cemetery the size of Normandy every three years, unnecessarily. And I said, what are we doing about it? And then I, I broke down the funded research we have tackling all those areas, and it's enormous. We have to go out and compete for this. And I went to elected leaders and I said, we, we have the talent. We want to bring in more talent. We can compete. And, and we want to stop filling up graveyards prematurely. And so it is that bigger purpose that you can't always capture. What, what I call is the soul of the university, the soul of a city. And that is what we most preciously nurture. So I thank all of you for being here today and sharing with us. I am sorry. You know, I have to go do all these other things. I would love to be sitting in this audience this morning and the rest of the day. I wish you the very best. It's all about relationships, and I hope you come away from this one with new ones, deeper ones that make your community in our community, an even better place to live. Thank you very much. All right, well, I have the, uh, the honor of introducing our, our very own Mayor Jim Gray first. Um, so there's, in, in this body of research that Ken and Ed were, were um, talking about, about the, the externalities of concentrations of human capital, um, there are some studies that show that there's greater civic participation uh, in university cities. When you get higher concentrations of, of folks with um, highly educated folks, they tend to participate more. Um, and I would argue they tend to make better decisions because they elect mayors like we have up here on our panel. Um, so first, let me introduce Mayor Jim Gray. So first elected in 2010, um, now in his second term as, as mayor. In his first term, uh, as many of you may remember, Lexington was facing deficits. Uh, mayor Gray cut nearly in half the city's annual employee health insurance costs and brokered a, an historic deal to reform the city's police and fire pension. Um, I see Chris Bartley in the room, who, who was um, uh, in the room with that. Um, he, that preserved the retirements of more than a thousand of our um, retired, pub, uh, retired and active public safety workers, uh, saving the city millions. A national actuarial firm labeled it the most effective pension reform in the country. Since then, he's invested in public safety, 
creating a, a fourth sector, police sector here in Lexington. And he's worked to revitalize the city's downtown by renovating the old courthouse, uh, which is nearly, nearly done, and creating the town branch commons, which is something he's going to talk a little bit about today. Um, and all that he does, Mayor Gray, focuses on three core themes, creating jobs, running government efficiently, and building a great American city. So here is Mayor Jim Gray. I'm going to follow the president's lead and use some notes, you all, so bear with me. This is quite a contraption here to deal with, yeah. But I know professors like it, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm really grateful to be on this panel with two great mayors, um, Wade Troxell from Fort Collins, Chris Beitler from Lincoln, two of our two of our university city colleagues. Um, what I'd like to do, uh, I'm going to take about eight to ten minutes to talk a little bit about Lexington and, as Scott said, a couple of projects that relate directly to the themes that we've been talking about today, competitiveness in a university environment, a university city environment. and and. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of Lexington. I'm going to start actually with the history of Lexington. Uh, many of you may know this, but some of you may not, who are Lexingtonians or visitors. We were settled 242 years ago in 1775, one year before the Declaration of Independence itself was signed. Fast forward to 1830s or so. Uh, Henry Clay was then senator from Kentucky. He was later secretary of state in the Adams administration, earlier in the Adams administration, actually. But so in 1832, Clay and the then mayor and um, the pr a prominent merchant in town, Benjamin Gratz, they raised a million dollars to build a railroad from Lexington to Maysville on the Ohio River, Kentucky. They didn't do this for cosmetics. They did it to stay competitive. Louisville at that time and other river cities were using river, river boats and trade was occurring on the river. So the railroad emerged and this was Lexington's opportunity to stay competitive. The president, President Capilouto, mentioned that in the 18, 1860s, I believe 1865 to be exact, the University of Kentucky was established. So the city and the university have been working together for a very long time. I don't have that remote. Do you have it, Scott? Help me. I've got a few slides, just a few. So, okay, here we go. Why don't you help me with it? All right. Okay, thank you. As he's doing that, what I'm, what I'm going to show you all is, uh, is today the uh, identity symbol for the city. Some of you, again, know this, but those who are visitors, I'm going to share it. This is um, what if <clears throat> this was developed, the identity symbol of the Blue Horse was developed about 12 years ago now. And um, to represent what then the designers, the graphic designers that, um, that helped us with this, they said, you know, they examined Kentucky, they examined Lexington especially, of course, and they said, you're not going to escape the horse. Fortunately, horses, basketball, even bourbon have a history here, prominent history in, in Lexington. But they said, you want to celebrate it in a perhaps new and unique way. So they took the, an image of the stallion Lexington here in the 1850s and uh, prominent and they took that image and they stylized it and what were they representing is in this juxtaposition they were representing that there's a long history here a long history but there's also a direction forward and a twist perhaps on it to suggest that there's inventiveness here there's creativity here, and there's a contemporary way of looking at things, which has a lot to do, of course, then, with a university city, a university environment, where 
so much is about looking forward, taking our history, taking the lessons from our history, and then looking forward. So Scott, help me with this. <laughs> You're going to have to. I am not accustomed to the professor's role, so. All right, that one. All right, I can get it now. Nope. You've got some new ones in there. So, dialing forward. Thank you, sir. I can get it now. I hope. All right. So we have this amazing real uh, juxtaposition that's underway in our city. We have a merged city county government. And at the time, a little before that merger, the city made a decision. I'm going to move on here. You all just hold your this bucolic image here, but we'll hold. I'll talk about this. The city made a decision almost 50 years ago uh, that we were going to create an urban services boundary to focus on in, to focus on preserving what's really remarkable and unique and special about our city, and that is the horse farms, the agrar the agricultural the agricultural environment, that industry, and what makes it special. All right, so that means focusing on infill. Now, there, as Professor Glazer said, there's a challenge associated with that, and Professor Trotsky also. There's a challenge associated with that. So we have to be thoughtful and we have to be careful. That's why every five years we examine this question. We're examining that issue today. We're thinking about better ways to even examine that question and issue. So today, yes, the city is known for basketball, bourbon, and horses, but increasingly we are known as a research and technological hub, a knowledge economy built around the university and its medical center. So we are thriving. The president said to me not long ago, we made a trip to Birmingham, his hometown in many respects, and what's going on in Birmingham is a similar dynamic to what's going on in Lexington. But he told me a story, he said, and why this is so important in the university city, why being competitive. He said, he said this, he got a call from, or he was recruiting a researcher couple, a um, man and his wife, and he was talking to, he was talking to the wife, and she said, Mr. President, she said, I want to live in a city that's alive, that's really engaged that's thriving, that's vibrant, that's a place where I want to live. And so what he said, he, it confirmed for him that the university's competitiveness and a vibrant city, in many respects an animated city, an active city, that this is essential for the university's competitiveness. Hence, it goes to a couple of projects that I'm going to describe. And thankfully, we have some of my administration's senior people here, our administration's senior folks here. Aldona Valicenti is working on one of these projects. And Aldona, hold your hand up. Our chief information officer, along with Scott Shapiro. Uh, we have several of our folks from the administration. Thank you, Glenn, for being here, Charlie, for being here, and others. Um, so two projects. One has to do with placemaking and the competitiveness offered through placemaking, quality of life, quality of place. And that's the image that we've got up here. The second has to do with technology and building a technological infrastructure. So this first image of, is of the Town Branch Greenway, uh, Town Branch Commons project. It represents 3.2 miles of a linear park through the heart of the city along the path of the Town Branch Creek, which was the water source around which our city was settled in 1775. This project will link 22 miles of bicycle and pedestrian trails, the Town Branch Trail and the Legacy Trail. And what's unique about it is it will go through the downtown, creating something else that's important in a 21st century university city separated bicycle lanes, pedestrian walking lanes, along this path, this 3.2 miles. 
Oh, that's all right. Yeah, keep going. <laughs> um, now, what does it, again, you know, this goes back to the, what the president had to say about competitiveness. This will be literally a couple of blocks from the northern part of the campus, the, uni the university's northern uh, border of its campus. So just a couple of blocks the university and the downtown are today. And that arguably will, over the next few years, you know, that border will probably just go away as the city and the university become closer connected. So this, in many respects, as uh, Mary Lynn Capilouto, Dr. Capilouto's wife, Dr. Mary Lynn Capilouto, who's on the advisory board for the town branch, she says it becomes, in many respects, the front door. Uh, the front yard to the university. So a cup, that's, this is another image. This is along uh, today Vine Street. It's hard to imagine that on our Vine Street today, isn't it? But it is a real potential. Now we've gained almost $40 million in funding for this project already in public funding and $5 million has been raised from the private, private sector for what will become the Town Branch Park, which this is an image of a 8 to 10 acres behind um, Rupp Arena and the, uh, and the Convention Center as, uh, as renovated. This project this project was designed, by the way, by a woman named Kate Orff. Uh, Kate was just in the last, this last week, uh, I think on Monday, was named a MacArthur Fellow, which is a MacArthur genius, uh, which is an extraordinary um, tribute to her. And uh, in the video, if you happen to take a look at it, in the video that the MacArthur Foundation released, Kate talks about the Town Branch, the Town Branch Park, uh, the Town Branch Linear Park, Town Branch Commons. Now, the last project that I'm going to mention, and it's going to be very quickly because I'm going to turn it over to Mayor Troxell, uh, and then after Mayor Troxell, Mayor Beitler, and then we will have some questions. Uh, the last project, and this is one I've mentioned that Aldona has been so involved in, our council members, uh, along with uh, Jake Gibbs and Vice Mayor Kay, been involved in this project as well as the town branch, uh, vigorously involved in these projects, and I thank them for that. The last project is the, and I have no image on this, but we are working, we are working on a gigabit project, and what's that? look like? Um, well, like most cities, we have a cable company and a legacy telephone company. And like most, there's not much competition for the internet services or access or cable TV. So we're aiming to change that, to bring in a fiber optic network that transmits data at the speed of light at gigabit speeds, 1,000 megabits a second. So this is very much like the uh, city of Chattanooga has done, a few other cities around the country, but it is all about staying competitive, and especially staying competitive in this university cities. We know that we need to be engaged with the outside world. That's what the president was talking about earlier, without limitations. We know that it's not easy, that every city in the country is working on it, but we got a head start of a couple of years, and that's what it's all about in staying competitive. So, thank you all. I'm going to now call on Mayor. Tro oh, I'm going to let Scott call on Mayor Troxel because he's got his CV, his bio, his resume, and he's going to do a great job of introducing. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I'm going to do two things at once here. Um, Okay. So, Mayor Troxell from Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, truly one of my favorite mayors in the country. Uh, I was elected in April 2015, re-elected um, in 2017, second term as mayor. Um, mayor Troxell is on the faculty. Uh, I was the associate department head, mechanical engineering at Colorado State University. So he's a uh, professor and a mayor. Uh, he had has his BS, MS, and PhD degrees in engineering from CSU. He's been on the faculty of the Department of Mechanical Engineering since 1985. He is an 
internationally recognized expert in the areas of intelligent robotics and intelligent control of distributed infrastructure systems. Um, his smart grid research has focused on intelligent systems and the integration of the distributed energy resources, including renewable energy and storage, into the electric power grid. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Mayor Wade Troxell. Thanks for the introduction. Um, <laughs> Well, it's a real honor for me to be here and, and uh, to join you and Mayor Gray and Mayor uh, Beitler and, and to be here. Um, great honor. How many of you are faculty? So I'm on the faculty at Colorado State University, as Scott pointed out, in mechanical engineering. And I've been on the faculty for quite a while. And also, I should really, I, th I think my story helps to tell Fort Collins' story. So uh, my father was also on the faculty at Colorado State University uh, since 1947. And, and uh, um, it, for, uh, CSU is a land-grant university. And when I was born, Fort Collins was 20,000 people. And the university was roughly about 5,000. <laughs> Now it's 167,000 people and 35,000. So um, as was pointed out in the earlier presentation, Fort Collins has had steady growth um, over that time. And it's, it's a wonderful place in, in so many ways. And uh, for me today, I just want to share some of those things that tell you about literally my hometown. My hometown where um, I'm fortunate to raise my family and have my kids, but also I was able to grow up and to see the kinds of things and the decisions that were made when I was growing up. And one of the things that um, this personal story brings is kind of this long-term view of the legacy that we're building upon looking towards the future uh, of our communities together. And I think that's so important to, um, I think, university cities. Because the, this quote that's been put, uh, put up uh, uh, already, we're in our 147th year of this journey to a great city. And so how are we leveraging that in a way that uh, even makes our city an even um, uh, greater place? So I talked about the, the steady growth and, and the natural beauty has been pointed out. Um, and some of the decisions that were made you know, by uh, legacy folks in our community. We have wide streets, wide streets because they were turning wagons around. So when Fort Collins was founded in 1864, Colorado State University was founded in 1870, and the state of Colorado, the centennial state, was 1876. So all those things, so from the very beginning, Colorado State University, then it was Colorado Agricultural College, and Fort Collins were literally joined at the hip. And so the industry was as well. And so that's an important aspect, I think, that um, to understand in the past in, in your community. Um, and coupling uh, that, that legacy um, is, uh, is an important part. So I mentioned uh, the wide streets and the founding of CSU. It's Fort Collins. It was never actually a fort. It was a camp along the Cache Laputa River. Uh, and then we were close to the Overland Trail. And so that's part of the, um, and there was uh, uh, French fur traders, but also a lot of influence from, uh, from Spain and Mexico uh, as well. So you see a lot of those uh, influences in, in our area. We have a council manager form of government. Uh, as a city, we became a home rule city in, in 19... Uh, 57 and uh, with council manager there's seven council members and the mayor and the mayor is directly elected um, uh, and, uh, um, and and I work closely with our, our city manager in looking at uh, this particular uh, picture and thinking about um, uh, our community you see um, so we have a good urban center that's located along the Cache Laputa River the, that was pointed pointed out the transportation system we have a train right through the middle of our community and that creates some of the challenges that we have today that was economic development 100 years ago 
was providing the right of way and the access um, through the pub uh, on the on the streets. And you can see that we have an old power plant that's been repurposed in the 1990s as our Energy Institute now. And it's very much part of the collaboration and the partnership between the university and the city. And to the right, you can see a new football stadium. And this is interesting, too. And I know you've had some challenges with the Rupp Arena and being a municipal owned and, and the relationship there. This was very controversial because we had a, another football stadium that was located um, next to our foothills and we're just right along the, the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. And um, it was three miles out of town. And so our current president, Tony Frank, who sends his regards, would like to be here, um, really uh, went out on a limb and uh, built a whole new stadium. They've had two games so far, so it opened this season. And it became very controversial in our community because if you can imagine developing a whole new infrastructure uh, that would seat 40,000 people and putting it in the urban uh, center where there wasn't the infrastructure, parking, transportation, other sorts of things to support it. And so that's in part part of the story um, today is the is the collaboration with the university and the city and our businesses. I put up this uh, slide because I use this a lot to think about our partnerships about, around the triple helix. And this is one of the assets that we all can build upon. Um, I look back at the Durham-Raleigh uh, partnership and, and, and their history in the late 50s um, with being a lot of anybody of any talent left. It was poor. Uh, the tobacco farming industry was in decline and things like that. They came together around the Research Triangle partnership and that is now very legendary in how it's really created uh, that area in terms of medical information technology and other areas, uh, a, a dynamic area. And I've always looked to that as a model, a way of thinking about integrating the triple helix, public sector, private sector, research university. And research in university is important. Uh, and Colorado State University does $340 million a year in contract and grant research. I'm a former research dean, so for the College of Engineering, and so um, those things are very important, but also I was very active in economic development in our community um, and in Colorado as it relates to the research university. And that dynamic is a very important one as well as was pointed out in our keynote. And so I, the, the triple helix model and the idea with the triple helix is that getting alignment, each one of the, the strands has a fundamentally different mission and how it's financed and that sort of thing. And if you can get alignment between the public sector, private sector, research, university, you can literally leverage in ways that I think are profound. And so one of the ways we think about and we talk about our city is city as a platform. You know, with a sharing economy, we talk a lot about platforms, whether it's an Uber or uh, BNB, share, uh, Airbnb, or, um, and, and so thinking of the city as a platform. We build a street, and that's a platform, platform for businesses to be located along the street to create commerce. And so when you begin to broaden that notion of a city as a platform, it becomes a platform for a lot of things. And when you think about everyone in your community as an active participant in your community as a co-creator in one way or another, it doesn't have to be you know, major things, it can be the small things as well, but it's a dynamic, it's an organism. And thinking about city as a platform, everyone as a co-creator in your community, and this is some of the language that we use and think about in our community about um, our community. And so what it does is drives kind, kinds of conversations around uh, when we talk about our climate and climate economy, that's a strategy that where we create not just jobs, we create wealth and industries that really are pointed towards the future. Um, when we talk about our economic health strategies, we, we basically it's incubate, grow, expand, and attract. And attract is last for a reason. We don't buy companies, for example. We create desirable places to live and be successful in terms of live, work, play, 
research and do what you do. And so we invest in that infrastructure and other things, the good things follow. And so that's an important dynamic as we think about um, economic health within our community. Um, and it's expanding beyond the climate economy. We have a music district where it's intentionally, purposely building um, uh, music as a business. But more than that, it's, it's part of the fabric of the community in ways, as we talked about, it's simply not the cultural things that might exist on campus or, or um, in, the, in, in our Lincoln Center on, in, in city but it's really creating more of a dynamic. And if there's one thing that comes from my research is uh, thinking is really the systems thinking and this integration and this dynamic of these cities as organisms and how do you create this vibrancy, this thriving kind of community. So city as a platform is an important part. And to the upper right there, it's an exhibit. And here it is uh, shown that at the uh, Smithsonian at the US Museum of American History uh, in a five-year run right now. It's an uh, it exhibit for places of invention and it features Fort Collins in the 19, excuse me, in the 2010s going forward as it relates to clean and a greener planet. And just to talk about the exhibit briefly, it's, it's, it t describes six cities. Five are in the past. Hartford, Connecticut in the 1880s. Hollywood in the 1930s. Um, uh, uh, Silicon Valley in the 1960s, Minneapolis in the 1960s, Bronx in the 1990s around music, and then Fort Collins is in the 2010s going forward. And the story that is described in the exhibit is one about collaboration and partnerships and creating an environment for success around economic development and thriving. And so that's an important part because that's intentional within our community is this, and when you talk to people, people say Fort Collins is friendly, engaging, people reach out for one another, it's a very giving community, and it goes to the metrics that Scott pointed out earlier, that it those begin to underpin the kinds of things that we know about our communities. And so a place of invention is an example of, of the, the part of our community. Some of the challenges that we have, and we've talked about some of this already, we have transportation uh, issues with traffic. As you can imagine, steady growth, um, one of our interstate, um, our governor in the 1970s, you know, we were to have the Olympics in 1976. And, and we turned them away. And a lot of the money that would have probably built infrastructure in terms of our highways has never materialized since. And so we have a lot of challenges with our interstates and our connectivity. And so um, that's one of our challenges is with, with transportation. You know, affordable housing is another one. It, but in a relative sense, we're still very affordable. But as it continues to go up, it makes it less affordable for those that continue to live in our community and students and that sort of thing. So that becomes more of an intentional part. And I mentioned the stadium as a as turning a challenge into truly an opportunity. I think most people view uh, having a venue of 40,000 as a, as a good thing, and it truly is, and it's proving out to be that as well. But when it was controversial within our community, working together, the university and the city, um, the university has, uh, has maintained every promise that was provided during those kinds of discussions. More than $20 million from the university has been, has improved the public infrastructure in the city's right of way. Um, and, and so, uh, for example, two tunnels that have increased and improved our multimodal transportation uh, to the university that has reduced a lot of the, uh, 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 you know, improved the safety and, and, uh, uh, and things like that have, have gone on as part of this partnership and so the, it's really uh, um, an important part of the message of the University City is the relationship it's simply not um, and this is where I think the word University City is important and, and different than town gown or different college town or different muni uni uh, kinds of discussions but it, you know, it really lists the opportunity and the alignment and the leveraging beyond just the uh, uh, 
what would I think get to the mundane thing that every university city has is you know there might be student housing issues there might be parties there might be to me that's kind of the that marginalizes when you talk about town gown I think um, the leveraging opportunity university city I think lifts it to a much higher level related to the data that underpins what makes university city such a special place and so why why and how is Fort Collins such a special place? Well, we talked about the beauty. Just some underpinning, I think, things that is a hallmark of Fort Collins is great planning. We talk about our city as being a plan and do city. Some cities plan, but don't do. Some cities do, but don't plan. And so by combining those two intentionally, so we have a very comprehensive uh, city planning process that when you're there, you appreciate um, there's this coherence of the sense of place throughout the community. Um, in, in that regard, there's decisions that were made, and this is the legacy element that you need to, uh, that we all need to appreciate. Um, decisions made in the 1960s when I was a young boy and actually I went to city council meetings on junior high my father was on city council too and and uh, and actually I was mayor when I was 14 for a day where I uh, represented the mayor um, but it made me aware of things then than how they've played out today and one of those is undergrounding of our electric power system a decision was made in 1960 to do that. And that's a very difficult decision um, from the standpoint of ROI and, and uh, well, it's not that bad and, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, um, one of those things that people don't necessarily see because they can't see it but fully appreciate is that the underground electric system. So all the view sheds are clean. And so that adds to the community in ways that, um, and those are, that was a hard decision made many years ago. Another one that, you know, in our town with 22 breweries and a couple of them national now, um, is that we were a dry town until 1969. And so I point that out to people as well in terms of it, from 1895 to 1969, we were a dry town. And now with um, uh, National Breweries as a part of our community, that's an important part. We have world-class companies um, like Woodward, um, Avago, uh, NVIDIA, Intel, um, HP, and uh, um, as well as uh, New Belgium Brewing and, and others. And so we have a high-tech, we have a vibrant, as I mentioned, music, but arts and culture, and, and all of it is intertwined with the university, which is actually where the symphony started in partnership with the city back in 1949. And so with that, um, I just, uh, you know, on the graphs that you've, you've seen earlier, but, you know, I just want to point out, and then this becomes a metric of how we follow our city. And so you can see Fort Collins called out on the various dimensions of the data as it relates to um, you know being a university city and so with that um, I thank you all and I'll turn back to Chris uh, or, or Scott for uh, introducing Chris thank you so much How many folks would like to underground our utilities in Lexington? <laughs> All right. Oops. So thanks for that. Um, Chris Bueller was elected mayor of Lincoln, Nebraska in May 2007 and re-elected in May 2011 and then again in May 2015, all right, uh, becoming the first mayor in Lincoln history to be elected to a third term. Third terms. Interesting. 
The native Nebraskan has also served six terms in the Nebraska legislature. He worked in the title industry for 15 years and started his own title company. As a development consultant for the city of Lincoln, he raised millions of dollars for the Parks and Rec Department. Uh, he's a graduate of Yale University and earned a law degree from the University of Nebraska. He's also served in the US Peace Corps and the US Army. Um, so here we have Mayor Chris Beitler of Lincoln. Thank you, sir. Oh, Mayor Truxell, you were mayor for a day when you were 14 and didn't figure out this wasn't the best job in the world. <laughs> if nothing else, the pace of change drives you crazy. But it's the most important thing you have to deal with. I mean, even here today, it used to be when a person approached a podium, it was just short people that had to worry about getting their heads over the podium now, right? Now medium-sized people have to pay attention to get their heads over all the other equipage that's on the, that's on the podium. I am, I am delighted to be here today. I am delighted to be a part of this discussion. This is kind of the uh, opening of the potential for cooperation in yet one more very important way among the people who make the kinds of decisions that we're called upon uh, to make. Uh, I, wa I do want to start out by uh, thanking all of the nonprofits and philanthropies uh, that are associated with this meeting today <clears throat> and who are continually associated with and more deeply engaged with municipalities around the countries uh, these days, recognizing uh, their need for assistance of different types. Uh, and there is a new thing in the nation happening in terms of that relationship between philanthropies and nonprofits and cities, uh, and it's a good thing. Most of us that uh, care about change and taking advantage of change are engaged in activities relating to open data and to performance indicators and to using volumes, increased volumes of information to make better decisions, and the philanthropies are foremost in helping us make that transition uh, to uh, rapid technology changes. So I did want to thank them uh, for that. Uh, and even with this first conference today, uh, I have I, I am changing something I am doing in light of Professor Glazer's discussion of the Sun Belt advantage. I'm going to stop talking about the horrific, epic blizzards in Nebraska <laughs> in 1873 and 1879 and thereafter. So with that, uh, let me give you a little background about our city. Let me make one point relating to an enormous sea change in the psychological uh, frame of mind in Lincoln. And then uh, we were asked to talk about a couple of ideas that might be transferable to other cities. And Scott, I'm sorry, I'm departing a little bit from that. Uh, and I think I want to add on some uh, some number above two with respect to the number of things Lincoln has been doing, just to give you maybe a broader flavor of change as it's happening in Lincoln, but I also know it's change as happening in Lexington and Fort Collins too. Uh, they were asked to describe uh, two things, and they're sticking to the rules, but I'm not. <laughs> Our university town, of course, as has been mentioned, is also the capital of Nebraska, a, a city that's celebrating its 150th anniversary this uh, year. In fact, our 
downtown is physically defined by state government on the south edge and the University of Nebraska main campus on the north side of the downtown. Between the two, uh, uh, it was built Centennial Mall uh, on our 100th anniversary, uh, which runs for seven blocks through downtown uh, from the state capitol uh, to the edge of campus. As a former state lawmaker, I think I can say with uh, some authority that Nebraska from time to time likes to do things a little differently. Our iconic Capitol building is one of only two in Nebraska that's done in an architecturally tower form by a fellow named Burton Goodrew out of uh, New York City and is truly uh, a world-class Capitol building. Inside that building you will find only one governing body, our nonpartisan, unicameral legislature that you all learned about when you were in fourth grade and forgot about <laughs> in, by fifth grade, right? Uh, but we're, uh, we're very proud of that system and we think it works. Nebraska is also uh, economically, more importantly perhaps, uh, exclusively a public power state. Our city-owned electrical utility is currently boasting that Lincoln is a back-to-back -back champion in the uh, Big Ten power rankings with the lowest average bill of all the cities in our conference. The unicameral legislature, public power, is the heritage of a guy named George Norris, uh, who was an outstanding United States Senator in the early 20th century. Uh, my uh, mayoral administration, uh, as has been mentioned, started a few years ago. I've now been in office 10 years. Uh, with two years to go, I took office, of course, then in 2007, shortly before uh, the Great Recession. One of the challenges at the time was the brain drain, what we called the brain drain, our educated young people uh, were leaving instead of graduating from the university and staying to build our own community. We needed to find a way to keep them in Lincoln and to attract even more young people so that we had the kind of creative community volume-wise uh, that we could continue to build. And one of the strategies involved was to increase the availability and the variety of recreational and cultural opportunities. Standing in the way at the time was an outdated 7,000 seat civic arena that was no longer able to attract uh, top touring shows. So shortly after my election, we all got together and uh, a big idea popped up. They wanted to build a state-of-the-art arena by imposing new taxes during the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. Good start. Huh? They wanted to build in a rail yard just uh, west of and enjoy and adjoining uh, our downtown's historic Haymarket area and that particular site had severe environmental problems and it was in a floodplain. So furthermore, it required moving tens of millions of dollars of railroad tracks and dealing with the BNSF. So uh, things came together though and in 2010 we put that difficult proposition to a vote of the people and it passed by a 12 point margin. That vote built the new arena, that built the new arena was the point I wanted to mention as a dramatic turning point in the psychology of our city. We found a way to build public-private partnerships and to build consensus to move the city forward. And we have replicated these new collaborations to accomplish dozens of sizable new projects 
over the last 10 years. By the way, we did find out that a beautiful new arena didn't buy you a winning basketball team. <laughs> The 15,000 seat Pinnacle Bank Arena opened in 2013 and is the home now of the University of Nebraska uh, basketball teams, both men's and women's, and it also has been hosting artists like Paul McCartney and Jay-Z and Pink, and we've transformed the area south of that arena from a dirty railroad yard into our new West Haymarket. It is now home to two new company headquarters, extensive residential and office space, a hotel, and five new parking garages that support them on five entirely new blocks. Private developers created the entertainment district across from the arena called the Rail Yard with bars and restaurants and a giant video screen and even ice skating in the winter. We uh, building is booming, not just there, but all across the city. Today, more of our young people are choosing to make Lincoln home. Uh, as NPR reported in a series a couple of years ago, Lincoln's strong tech startup community is making our city a hub of the Silicon Prairie. CBS News said Lincoln is becoming a, a mini Palo Alto as home to more than 100 software startups. One of those is Huddle, a firm started by several uh, university graduates with just three employees. The sports video company now has 400 employees in 14 countries. It chose to build its new world headquarters in our West Haymarket, which is quickly now and purposely being developed into a central entrepreneurial hub in our city. Today, Lincoln has a new energy, a new can-do spirit that you feel across the city. And with that, I want to share a couple of projects with you in perhaps more depth, depth than you're interested in, and then change the script a little bit to talk about some things that actually are maybe even bigger than those two in, in the minds of many of you, I'm sure. But the first thing I wanted to note was the enhancement to our downtown traffic system, the N Street Cycle Track, is the region, region's first protected bikeway for the exclusive use of cyclists. Lincoln is a city that loves biking. Uh, biking, we have an extensive network of 132 miles of trails last week. We celebrated winning the National Bike Challenge for the third time in five years by logging in more than 700,000 miles. Wisconsin was in that competition, by the way, and we kept butt. <laughs> and we didn't quite beat them in the football game, but, but we did well in biking. And with the arena and the West Haymarket and a sharp increase in downtown residential space, especially for student housing, the number of cyclists in our downtown is, is growing. We see that as a very positive trend. We understand, we think that millennials don't necess necessarily share our generation's uh, uh, love affair with the automobile. Uh, young innovators are looking for alternative modes of, of transportation and the challenge is, of course, to encourage cycling in downtown and keep uh, riders safe and reduce uh, automobile and parking problems. The in street cycle track opened in 2015. It runs for 17 blocks from the east downtown area to the new Arena Drive in the West Haymarket on the west side. Uh, it provides critical connections, and this was an important thing to us, to the rest of the trails that, that stream uh, long and deep on both the east and west side of the city, uh, and they connect the two systems of trails across the downtown. Uh, the two-way bike lane is separated from traffic and every intersection has traffic control devices for cyclists and for motorists and for pedestrians. It's a $3.2 million project funded with both 
private and uh, public funds, included tax increment financing, private donations from a great nonprofit in our state called the Great Plains Trails Network. Uh, <clears throat> it had a share of critics uh, and controversy, but it's proven to be a great addition. Even before it opened, the People for Bikes organization ranked it as one of America's 10 best bike lanes. In the last year, nearly 100,000 riders have used the cycle track. That includes nearly 12,000 in the month of June alone. Developers of a new mixed-use district uh, that will <clears throat> that is another uh, great project in progress. We call it the Telegraph District. It's on the east side of our downtown, and it uh, has cited the cycle track as a factor in their uh, decision making. The second project I wanted to mention, and uh, with a little uh, more length, uh, has to do with the direct partnership with the University of Nebraska and with the private sector. Uh, I need to back up and give you a little bit of history. The second year I was in office, the state legislature, uh, with the uh, advice and consent of the municipality of, of Lincoln, decided to move the state fair from Lincoln, uh, where it had been since uh, 1901. The state fairgrounds just northeast of the university campus had become come run, run down and the university was looking for room to expand in that area. Uh, today the new state fair is thriving elsewhere in central Nebraska and the former fairgrounds is now home to the university's innovation campus which is uh, in a sense the second entrepreneurial hub in the city of Lincoln along with the West Haymarket area. It's uh, more a research campus designed to facilitate partnerships between the university and private sector businesses, both new and established businesses. One of its goals is to be the most sustainable research and technology campus in the nation, and we found a way to use city resources to help make that happen. The city has a wastewater treatment plant in, in the vicinity of Innovation Campus. In 2013, the city and the university entered into a 50-year agreement to use reclaimed water discharged from that plant as an energy source to both heat and cool Innovation Campus facilities. The project was named the Central Renewable Energy System, or CRESS for short. The city uh, and the university leveraged qualified energy conservation bonds to fund the initial uh, $12 million investment. That Department of Energy program enabled us to borrow money at lower rates to fund energy conservation projects. Under the agreement, the city provides up to 24 million gallons of reclaimed water per day. That amount can support up to one 0.8 million square feet of development. Conservation estimates indicate the Crest system will save 25% of the cooling and 30% of the heating cost when compared to conventional system. The Crest has a longer life expectancy also, which adds up to more savings. And on top of that, Crest is anticipated to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by up to 79, I'm sorry, 97%. In exchange for supplying the reclaimed water, the city receives one-third of the revenue generated from the energy sales, uh, which are marked to uh, and based on and related to uh, other energy prices, uh, alternative energy prices in the city. Projections show the Crest has the potential to generate up to $4.5 million for the city over 25 years. There are very few systems like this in North America. From the economic development perspective, this is the type of initiative we think can make a difference in our ability to attract, uh, attract businesses to Innovation Campus. So those are the two projects, uh, and after this there are no more slides, so don't blame Shapiro here for, for not flipping the slides. Uh, they don't exist, but I just wanted to tell you quickly, uh, perhaps to encourage those students who are applying for scholarships, and 
and are looking for a variety of ideas to, just to go through quickly uh, a few other things that we've been doing. We have our ALO project, which is uh, our fiber to home project. And it was designed to be a four year uh, partnership uh, with a company called Nelnet and with a company called ALO uh, to bring fiber to every home in Lincoln. Uh, it has now gone on for about a year and a half, and they're halfway there. It's, it's, it's going to be a tremendous thing for us, uh, and, <clears throat> and we will have fiber, high-speed, gigabyte fiber going to every home in Lincoln. We already have accomplished the downtown broadband project, and anywhere you are in the downtown, you have available to you through city conduit uh, five different providers that can provide you with high-speed internet services competitively we are also halfway into our what we call our fiber to mobile uh, project which will result in about a year and a half uh, in uh, 200 placements of small cells in key locations around the city and especially in the downtown Beyond that, we've, we've built three beautiful downtown plazas, one in each uh, sector of our downtown. We're, we're very proud of those. I think you saw a picture of, of uh, what we call Ascent in Tower Plaza, the colorful glass uh, uh, tower that was roundly criticized when it was built and is beloved by all today. I am proud to say some of these placemaking things that attract people to a community are very hard to do, and I congratulate Mayor Gray for taking on uh, this Greenbelt project. Uh, my experience has been that, that people love these things once they come into existence, if they're well done, uh, and we, we engage in that. The arts and culture uh, are important, we think. Uh, beyond that, three more things that are on the runway right now, <coughs> community learning centers. We have a problem with poverty in, in, in Lincoln. We have a lot of kids on, uh, uh, low, uh, on the lunch program, federal lunch program. Uh, these are also kids uh, we need to be a part of our workforce, uh, both uh, uh, from a, a strictly selfish city point of view and also from a fairness point of view. The community learning centers, uh, it is the concept of uh, a joint partnership between a school district and the city whereby the uh, city provides money to the school district and the school district provides facilities for after school programming primarily and some before school pro programming. Uh, it can relate to social services, it can relate to programming and, uh, and some of the technical needs starting with younger students in the grade schools and the high schools. It's getting the city in our case involved in education in a deeper sort of way and even eventually into early education. We have what we call a Prairie Corridor project going which is very reminiscent reminiscent of what Jim is doing. We have 500 acres of prairie in a, in a park that's on the edge of our town. 12 miles out is Spring Creek Prairie, another 2,000 acres of prairie run by the Audubon Society. And what we're doing is building prairie between the two places, a prairie corridor, which will have a trail running all the way from the city to Spring Creek Prairie. Uh, it will be a great educational tool for kids will be our place of identity. When the Omaha Lincoln metropolitan area is one thing, it will be identified by the Prairie Corridor, uh, just as other cities, Fort Collins is identified by the mountains and other places are identified by the sea. So that's a huge long-term project. And then we're trying to develop consensus on a new downtown library. Uh, and consensus on that is a little hard these days because of the changing nature of what a library is. So 
there's more on the list, but the time I know has run out. Uh, I appreciate your listening to uh, the problems and the solutions of a small town in Nebraska, but we enjoy being a part of all of this. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mayor Breitler.